Welcome to the Education USA Virtual Hockey Showcase. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jenica Heim and I'm your Education USA advisor in Canada. Education USA is a US Department of State network of over 400 international student advising centers in more than 170 countries. The network promotes US higher education to students around the world by offering accurate, comprehensive, and current information about opportunities to study at accredited post-secondary institutions in the United States. To learn more about the network, you can go to educationusa.state.gov. Education USA in Canada is based in Ottawa, um, and your advisor is me. <laughs> uh, I help students all across Canada, um, and I've had the chance to meet some of you in person, but more often than not, we're doing a lot of virtual events these days. Um, so if you're interested in any free advising, you can sign up for an advising session. We can talk more about opportunities to study in the United States. I mostly help out on the admissions side, understanding admissions procedures. Um, I do a lot of boot camps. Um, so I recently did a couple of SAT boot camps. I'll usually run another one in the summer. I'll send you all some information about that when I have it scheduled. I do a Common App boot camp as well in um, August, and that's for students who are planning to apply for that admission cycle. I'm very active on Instagram where we were promoting this event and we were also, um, we do a lot of student spotlights. So um, we'll be doing a lot of these pop-outs today. So you can either click on the uh, blue button to go to wherever the website is, or if you look in the upper right hand corner, you can click the X and you can close that box. You can find that information on that box at any time in the handout section um, where that will be available throughout the session. And I'll, there will also be other handouts loaded there um, throughout the session. You can uh, ch check out webinars like this every month. Um, I spotlight different kinds of study. We've done like liberal arts colleges or community colleges or um, a bunch of different kinds of institutions, STEM universities. Um, so the goal of this session is to really highlight the different kinds of hockey programs that are out there, the kinds of universities that have hockey programs. So it's really, today's session is really a combination of admissions information and understanding uh, different hockey programs available. Of course, we'll just, we just have eight people on today, um, but they should showcase a nice diversity of institutions. You can always email me at ottawa at educationusa.org, and then my website is educationusacanada.ca, where you can find more information about studying in the United States. We're going to start today with a 30 minute presentation uh, overviewing hockey in the United States. Um, so you can understand what the different divisions look like, what the eligibility looks like. This is going to be a fairly brief <laughs> overview. Um, and uh, but hopefully a good primer, especially for those of you who are new to finding out more about this process. And then you're going to hear from eight different institutions. As you can see, we've got four division NCAA Division I schools, three NCAA Division II schools, and a school that's actually in the NAIA, who are all going to be talking to you about their programs. And quite a few of them also have club programs that are part of the ACHA division. If you're not sure what that is, you're going to learn right now. So we'll start off with the university and hockey options in the United States and learning a little bit more about those. So first, which sports conferences have ice hockey? Um, and today we are talking about both men's and women's ice hockey. Um, I'll talk about both in each of our presenters. I made sure we had schools that have men's and women's programs. So they will be highlighting both men's and women's programs throughout. So when it comes to NCAA, that's the National Collegiate Athletic Association, Association that's the largest uh, athletic uh, association in the United States. Um, and Division I is the largest division that has the, um, has the most funding related to it, um, which is why they also can give athletic scholarships. Uh, in hockey, so in most sports, there's three divisions one, two, three. But in hockey, just because there's there's fewer teams, um, there's fewer division, there's there's fewer teams, and so there's fewer divisions. There's mostly just division one, division three. There's a little asterisk to that. You'll see it on the next slide. Um, but basically you're looking at 61 teams in D1 and 84 teams in D3. 
um, Division Three hockey will not have athletic scholarships. Uh, hockey players can always get academic scholarships, need-based scholarships, other scholarships that the university may give, but it wouldn't be an NCAA uh, hockey athletic scholarship. Um, and so because of that, uh, there are no specific eligibility requirements you need to play hockey at, in Division III. Uh, you would simply need to adhere to the admissions requirements of the university in order to get in. If you want to learn more about which programs are available, you can go to the NCAA dot org slash directory website, one of my favorite websites, um, because you can see more like where, um, who all the different programs are uh, for division one and division three. ACHA is the club division of hockey. Um, so a club sport, typically um, the athletes, just like, just like if you play for a club, um, recreationally uh, for any sport near you, you have to pay for it, right? So like you pay for your travel, you pay for your equipment, you might do an, a bit of fundraising. If it's Since it's associated with the school, the school might give you some things like rink time or things like that. But a lot of it is going to be like student con contributed. And because of that, it usually means that any student can play for that uh, sports team. So um, there's three men's divisions. I accidentally forgot to put there's two women's divisions. Um, and there's a lot of ACHA teams across um, across the United States. And oftentimes schools that have division one or division three teams might also have an ACHA team available. So that just depends on what level of hockey you're looking to play at the next level. And I have seen some schools with ACHA um, do have some scholarships related to hockey, but it's usually like smaller scholarships um, and it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be um, something um, that's kind of related to the eligibility requirements like the NCAA has. There are other institutions in the United States um, and divisions that do not have hockey. So as I mentioned, Division II doesn't have um, a hockey league, but there are technically five women's teams in Division II. Um, they would play with either Division I or Division III teams. I haven't looked through all five to see exactly where they play. I'm going to assume they play up to D1, but I'm not sure about that. Um, so if you're interested in any one of those five teams, you would need to just speak to the coach on um, what division they play in. The uh, NAIA does not have hockey teams. However, asterisk, we have Concordia University here today who is part of NAIA. Um, but typically what that means is that they would um, compete in the ACHA division uh, because there aren't going to be a large number of NAIA schools that have teams. And lastly, junior colleges do not have hockey. So in some sports, athletes can use junior colleges for transfer opportunities. Um, and hockey is just really not a sport where that, um, where that works because there's just not any teams. Or if there are, they're going to be so few that they'll play likely with uh, NAIA. Oh, I'm sorry, with, uh, with ACHA. Quick trivia, fun trivia. Here we go. How many Canadians play D1 ice hockey? What do you think, men and women? Um, you can give me a men's total, a women's total, a full total of everybody. Um, what do you think? Fancy a guess. I'm gonna wait till a couple guesses come in. I'm going to I'm going to give you a hint. I'm going to give you two hint, hints. Men's ice hockey has the largest number of international athletes of any sport in the United States. And women's ice hockey has the third largest number of D1 uh, international athletes competing in the United States. The only one in between is women's women's soccer has has more athletes. All right. We've got some guesses coming in. Oh, Angelos, I think I'm going to I'm going to give you the win on this one if we're playing prices right rules. Oh, we've got some people who got like the real numbers almost. 
Carter was 736. You're so close. It's 714 total athletes, men 442 and women 272. There's basically one Canadian player for every two American players playing hockey. And this is just division one. We don't have numbers for deep because there's no eligibility registration process. We don't have uh, numbers on D3 or or ACHA. So tons of Canadians in the U.S. playing hockey. So as I mentioned, if you wanted to play ACHA or Division Three, you simply need to adhere to the requirements of the university in order to gain admission and then be eligible to play. There aren't any additional steps you need to take. If you are looking to go into Division One, there are eligibility requirements that are critical for you to meet. So this is important information if you're looking at D1 or one of those five D2 women's schools. This would also be relevant. So the NCAA is an eligibility center. They're rule makers and rule keepers. They're a clearinghouse that help you um, ensure that you've met some basic academic and amateurism requirements, and they are a resource. There's tons of information, PDFs, et cetera, um, on their website. And I am gonna put those in the handouts when I uh, finish up. I should have preloaded them, but um, I promise I'll get them in there right away after I'm done talking. It is not a matchmaker. So the recruitment process needs to happen directly with coaches and um, the NCAA is simply helping facilitate the eligibility process. They're not um, like kind of recruiting for you or helping put you directly in contact with coaches. Um, while they will allow you to put up some information about your basic um, statistics and like position, it's there's not a lot of space for other materials. So if you're looking for a place to house like say recruitment materials and videos, uh, highlight videos, stuff like that, you need to use other channels like YouTube. Um, the NCAA is not a robust recruitment site. It's really just to make sure that the coaches can see that you're on track with your eligibility and that you've registered, you have an ID number, and that you can move forward with the recruitment process. So as I mentioned, the two main categories of eligibility are amateurism and academic eligibility. Um, you will use NCAA.org as your top resource to review eligibility requirements and stay up to date. Now, because of COVID-19, things have been changing and updating. You absolutely should check out this webinar that's happening at 9 a.m. May 26. Um, I, it, the NCAA typically records, so if it's super early for you, I know we have some BC people uh, in the house, 6 a.m. seems a little early. I would suggest registering um, so that you get updates and potentially a recording. They're gonna go over any changes to eligibility that have been happening. Um, it's complicated. I'm not gonna try to get really into those details um, today. Uh, so this is gonna be a full hour if you really wanna understand eligibility better and some of the changes um, and adapt adaptations that have been made because of COVID. The direct way to sign up for an account and start and to get an NCA ID is at eligibilitycenter.org. You can do that at any time. Like you can start that in grade nine, grade 10, whenever you want to, just to start learning more about the process and to get an ID number. It does cost, I think, 90 US dollars to um, open an account. So if you're not sure uh, yet, you can wait to pay um, until you, you, um, you're pretty sure that D1 is, is the move for you. Um, so, but once you sign up and create a profile, you can start getting direct emails about things like these sorts of webinars that are really, really useful uh, to make sure that you understand um, how to stay on track with your eligibility. When it comes to uh, amateurism, there's some very specific rules for men's hockey, and I will upload a handout uh, with a, a, a little bit more information on this. Um, and so it's really important to pay attention uh, to some of these require, uh, requirements. You might lose your amateurism, which amateurism is not being a professional, right? So you're considered having kind of like crossed the line into professional if you make an agreement with an agent 
Um, and an agent would be a person who's trying to get you a professional contract. Um, if you sign with a professional uh, or major junior team, if you receive payment or expenses from a professional or major junior team, and then um, there are some very specific requirements about trying out. If you try out with a major junior team and um, you're past 48, I, 48 hours and they're giving you expenses, then that also kind of crosses the line. So there's some very, very specific rules and you need to make sure that if you are going to engage in something like a tryout, that you understand um, more deeply what these rules are um, if you wanna keep your NCAA options open to you. To play NCAA, you must be an amateur athlete. And for women, it's there's um, there's not kind of the same level of like crossing a line at such a young age. It doesn't amateurism rules tend to be the same across a lot of other sports where when athletes tend to be amateur just by virtue of playing in their normal leagues. Um, so you will find that the women's amateur rules are going to be more in line with the rest of the other sports. Um, okay, so academic eligibility. This is where people tend to have a lot more questions. So it's really important to um, understand if you're on track. And if you ever want me to help you with this, I'm always happy to help people um, with a um, create a GPA. Um, so the only so the GPAs that you create are very specific to this like NCAA um, worksheet here. So the academic eligibility is that you need 16 core courses in grades 9 through 12. So if you're a school, like let's say you're in Alberta um, and your school's 10 through 12, your grade 9 is also part of this. You need to take four years of English. Now, you'll see that word years on the website for NCAA. What they really mean is a credit, like a course. Um, and so that's really normal for most people to have taken four years of English. If you're at a school where the first language is French, then first language French will count as your English requirement. I know that sounds a little bit funny, um, but basically think of English as first language. Three years of math, two years of science, one more year of English, math or science, Two years of social sciences and social sciences are things like history, geography, psychology, anthropology, economics. There's like a, there's usually a pretty long list um, on the website nca.org slash course list of courses that you can use. And then you, you need four more courses of um, anything above. So you can take more English, math, science, or social science. Also, if you take a foreign or second language, um, those classes count here. So if you are uh, going to a French language school and you took four years of French, and then you also took four years of English, then those would easily slot into both those spots. You've done half your core courses if you've done four, four years of second language. Um, so Georgia's asking a great question. In Alberta, we get a raise in our grade going to university out of province. What kind of raise do we get? So in the NCAA, every single province has their own grading scale. And basically you get a, a you get a four if you have an A. And the A is a slightly different for each province. Most provinces, it's 80 to 100. So in Alberta, 80 to 100 is an A. So is, it is in Ontario. So it is in Quebec. I know in BC, it's 85 to 100. Um, and then a B for a lot of provinces is 70 to 79. Um, <laughs> it, it's different province to province. In Alberta, it's actually 65 to 79. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna upload a few things in handouts that I'll, that you can refer to that will show your, your province's grading scale as well. Um, because each province has, oftentimes has a slightly different grading scale. So in the context of NCAA eligibility ID, any uh, eligibility, I'm sorry, eligibility GPA, anything over a four, um, anything over an 80 for most provinces is gonna be a 4.0 grade average. Now we're gonna talk in a second about admissions. Admissions might look at your stuff a little bit differently, but right now we're just talking about being eligible to play sports. So to be eligible to play sports in division one, when you take all those 16 core courses together, the grades you received in those courses, you need to have at least a 2.3 to be 
eligible to play sports. That's just the, the check mark that says you can play. OK, so the NCAA, their goal is to just say, check, you can play, whereas the university or the coach might say, um, we actually need your grades to be a little bit higher to be able to come to our university. Our, our admissions department needs, you know, even though the baseline to be eligible is here, we need you to be here in order to play. OK, so we're ordered to be recruited. So um, it's important always, the, the better grades you can get, the more opportunities you will have. Traditionally, SAT or ACT scores are required for NCA eligibility. However, because of COVID, they were waived this last, um, this 21-22 uh, academic year. So students who've been recruited and are gonna start in the fall, they did not have to submit scores. And then they've also announced that students for the upcoming ac academic year. So if you're um, if you're wanting to be recruited over this year so that you can enroll in fall 2022, you do not need to take an SAT or an ACT that has been waived. The timeline is important. You have to graduate high school on time. Um, when I say it says here four years of high school, now that means um, that's what you'll see on the website for like a traditional um, high school in the United States. But I want you to think of once you start grade nine, you need to graduate in four years. So if your high school is three years, you need to graduate in the three years of your high school. Um, you need to complete 15 out of 16 of the core courses. By the time you graduate, you can save just one core course for the for afterwards, um, where you can complete in this in the year following. Now you can keep upgrading and taking other courses just to improve grades, but when it comes to that core coursework and eligibility, you have to adhere to this timeline. Um, Delayed enrollment, um, for most sports, delayed enrollment is 12 months. What that means is after you graduate for a full year, you can take a gap year, you can delay your enrollment before you um, go and play in the NCAA, and you won't have any lost um, time. Men's hockey is an exception. Men's hockey has its own rule. It's the only sport that's like this, where you get to delay your enrollment all the way to your 21st birthday. So what that means is sometimes you have hockey players who are maybe three years out of high school before they're enrolling in, in university uh, because of that delayed enrollment period. Now, with COVID, the delayed enrollment period has actually even been extended further. That's the area where it's really complicated and it's hard for me to answer questions about that. Um, but basically, um, there's been an additional year added, but it depends on when you graduated um, in order to know exactly how much your grace period is. So again, I suggest you um, go to that NCAA eligibility webinar so that you can find out more about it and ask specific questions to the pros so that you know exactly what how much your delayed enrollment can be. Delayed enrollment is sometimes also called a grace period or a gap year. Um, so after your delayed enrollment period, you have five years to complete four seasons in the NCAA. So what that means is like um, if you get in um, and you're not going to see playing time because they're just not going to let you because you're a first year and you're going to sit on the bench for a year, you could be a red shirt just for that, or if you're injured, or if you need to improve your academics, right? So there's kind of three different ways to be what's called a red shirt. So if you take a red shirt year at any time, which if you get injured, you would take a red shirt year, you would still have four years to compete. So sometimes people will graduate after five years, or some people will graduate at four and then go in and do a, a grad degree. And um, you have students in graduate school who are able to take that fifth year. A few things to remember. So as I mentioned, you know, this was all NCAA eligibility requirements. You also need to look at what are the requirements to get into the university itself. So um, those might differ slightly. So for example, even though, uh, even though in the core courses, it was kind of optional whether or not to take a second language, some universities might have a requirement to take a second language for either one or two years during your high school. That varies a lot across the United States whether or not a school will have that as a requirement. Um, 
And so usually what I let students, younger students know is just, you know, stay with a second language for two years just to make sure that you've checked that off and that you're eligible for any university that wants to recruit you. Otherwise, the other core courses that the NCAA has are really in line with what most universities would require of a student or highly recommend from a student. The other, um, the other one is the SAT ACT. Even though the NCAA said they're not going to need it this year, and a lot of universities have also said, we know it hasn't been available, we're not gonna require, require it either. Some universities are still requiring it for admissions and even some are requiring it if you want scholarships. So let's take, for example, if you're looking to go division three and the D3 school, you know, you're hoping to get some academic merit scholarships, and that institution says, oh, we need an SAT or ACT score in order to give you scholarships. Um, so that might be a, a time when you're like, oh, okay, so I would need um, SAT, ACT for these scholarships. Um, so, you know, it's something that you should consider taking if it's available to you. I know right now there's, it's not available with the, the way COVID spiked. It's hard to get get in for a test. But if in the fall you're able to take a test, it's a good idea. The other thing is that coaches will often use it as a recruiting tool. They're used to, you know, admissions telling them, um, we need your athletes to kind of be at a certain academic profile. They might even have a minimum SAT score that they're working off of. And if you're able to say, oh, okay, here's my SAT score, the coach goes, oh, great. That's like what we're looking for, that you're meeting our academic requirements of where what we need for our school. In the US, there's just a real range of admissions um, of, you know, the most highly selective universities, they're going to be a lot more rigid on, on, on students' academics. Good question. How do you register for an SAT or ACT? I'll throw that right here in the chat for you. The collegeboard.org is where you register for an SAT and ACT.org is where you register for the ACT. And these are um, these tests are very similar. You can take either one. It doesn't matter. Um, you should just check what's closest to you. Of course. Remember, as a recruited athlete, you still do need to apply to the university you'll be going to. And um, there's two different kinds of kind of commitments. You can make a verbal commitment to a coach, um, and that is not yet binding. Obviously, if you make a verbal commitment, you should follow through with it. Um, but the actual binding commitment is the letter of intent, which is signed um, for Division I only because that's related to athletic scholarships. Since we're running uh, into our 30 minutes here, these are just a few final tips. Remember to get be organized, respect, respectful, honest, and responsive. And um, if you wanna contact me, here are the myriad of ways to do that. And Jonathan's asking at what age to take SAT or ACT. It's geared towards a grade 11. So I would say um, you can definitely, yeah, five years of high school in Quebec. Uh, you know, usually you're going to go into CEGEP, Jonathan, and a CEGEP student is going to be well prepared for the SAT. Uh, you're looking at a secondary sank level of math. So if you've taken CEGEP one, it, and you're you're you should be at the right level. I think if you have been learning in French, the one thing you'll find is that it's a, a fast test, and you need to work on time management, um, and that can be a little bit more challenging, doing a, a test that's kind of fast in English. So definitely practice. I will stick around and answer your questions. So as we go, um, use the Q&A chat to answer, ask questions. Use the private chat as well. You can ask directly uh, questions directly to me. Uh, throughout this presentation, you're going to hear from both admissions officers and a representative from their athletic programs. Um, a lot of hockey coaches are here today. Um, and so the goal is really just to learn about their programs. This is an info session. And then you can uh, communicate in the Q&A in the private chat to learn more about their programs. Um, I'm inviting Finlandia to jump on. So if you will both, both come on, I can move things over. There she is. Hi, Lauren. Hello. All right, I will go ahead and hand things over to you. And uh, all right, and there's Lindsay.
Thank you so much. So I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lauren Husted. I am the Women's Athletic Enrollment Officer. So I help with actually all of our women athletes who are coming through, um, whether that be hockey or softball or volleyball. And we also have our women's um, head coach here for hockey, Lindsay Macy, who is here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by giving you guys some information on the university itself. Um, I want to kind of go over, you know, where we're located. I know obviously you are all Canadian students, so you might have no idea where we are. Um, and then also give you some information on programs and then we'll dive into the hockey piece as well. Um, so I wanted to give you a visual here. You can see um, Finlandia is located in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And so you'll see actually where our little marker is. We are all the way up in what is called the Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, so we are surrounded by Lake Superior, which does mean we get a lot of snow. In fact, Hancock, Michigan, which is where Finlandia is located, is um, actually the third snowiest city in the nation. So I actually Googled that before I moved here um, just to kind of know what I was getting myself into. Um, the Keweenaw itself, um, in my opinion, is probably one of the most beautiful places in the United States that you could go to, um, especially in Michigan. So we are, you know, surrounded by water and nature, and it is very nature centric. Um, so there in our university, there's about four to six hundred students. So we are definitely on the small side. Um, we are Division three. So Jenica went through, you know, what that means for you guys, too. Um, but we also are in a college town. So you'll see the bridge on the photo that's all the way to the left. And so on one side is Hancock and that's in the Keweenaw. And then the other side is Houghton. So we actually have another local school, um, a community college and another university locally, which means that there are a lot of people your age that you get the chance to interact with. So it's a really fun environment. Um, and then additionally, there's a lot of um, tourism in the area. So there's always a lot of things happening, a lot of events going on and a lot of fun things and a lot of new people to meet, which is probably one of the most fun parts about going to school. Campus itself, um, again, is located in Hancock, Michigan. Here's a couple of shots of the campus. Try to get some where it's snowy and some where it's in you know, more of the fall time as well. Um, the building in the middle is actually our new College of Health Science building, and I will get into some of the programs, but we do have programs including physical therapy um, and nursing and even pre-medicine as well, depending on what you know, program you're interested in. On the far right, that's actually our housing facilities. Um, we have one housing building and many students who do choose to live off campus still live very close, but all of our students live in our Finlandia Hall, um, and that's actually where the cafeteria is as well. So next here is just a couple more pictures of campus. I wanted you guys to be able to see our brand new uh, weight room. So this was all remodeled about a year ago. So everything is super new. Um, it's open from 6 a.m. to 11 for students. And then you are also going to be having practices in there or uh, weightlifting sessions. So it's somewhere where as an athlete, you'll find yourself quite often. Um, another thing to uh, know about the area is that if you are someone who enjoys the outdoors, that is definitely part of the culture here. So think, you know, things like hiking, fishing, snowboarding, um, skiing, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, pretty much anything you can imagine for the outdoors, um, we have it. We have uh, two ski hills that aren't too far from here too. And as a student, there's a lot of discounts that you can get. Um, and additionally, we try to get our students out into the area. Um, in fact, you can even take hiking classes with us, which means that you'll be able to actually um, go out and explore as part of a class. Um, many students who are going into like environmental sciences already get a little bit of that but that is open to any student who wants to participate. For the academics, I wanna go over what programs we have just briefly. Um, there are a lot, so this is something that you'd wanna explore on the website. We have programs that are based within business, the arts and the sciences, health sciences, and art and design. So that could range anything from sport management um, to graphic design and marketing to ceramics. We even have a minor in uh, fashion design as well. A lot of business students will actually pair that together. Um, and then with health sciences, I mentioned these a little bit too, but we do have an amazing nursing program. So if nursing is an option for you, or if you're thinking about nursing, our program um, is really small, which does mean you get a lot of personalized attention. In general, you're going to be in very small class sizes no matter what program you're in, which is going to be anywhere from about 9 to 25 students per classroom. Um, additionally, when it comes to student support um, in and outside of the classroom, um, you are going to have a lot of support from your professors and faculty members. In fact, your advisor at the university is a faculty member. So the same people teaching your classes and helping you through that coursework are also the same people mentoring you and guiding you through the program and making sure that you have all of your questions answered and are making the right choices in your electives. 
Additionally, we also have student support services like tutoring. Um, we also have uh, a CBC, which is a career and vocation center. So instead of just um, you know, going to class and getting your coursework done, we really wanna invest in you as a student as well. Um, and what that means is that we have personalized guided meetings um, with a career service member who's going to make sure that you understand the program you're going into and also understand your options for things like internships and also um, experiential learning. So we want you out in the field. Some of that's already built into the programs, but we really wanna make sure that you have a full understanding of the program you're going into. Student life, so this is a super important part of um, going into college. You guys wanna have fun while you're in school. You're already gonna have fun because if you're gonna join a team, that's gonna be super fun in itself. Um, but we have a lot of different things that you can get involved in. Again, a lot of students in the area like to get involved in the outdoors. Um, so you can see, actually, I was able to find a picture of some of our Canadian students who were um, participating in a parade in downtown Hancock. Um, so you can see that in the slide there. Um, and then we also do a lot of focus on uh, service work. So students can um, actually even gain scholarships for doing service work, um, up to $2,000 a year for volunteerism, um, eight hours per semester. Um, so that's a benefit not only to the community, but to you, because you can actually gain scholarships through the work that you do with our community. So when it comes to admissions and financial aid, um, Jenica did a great job of explaining, you know, what that process is going to look like and what the difference is between each school. Um, for us, we have a pretty simplified process. As an international student, there are extra things that you may have to present to us, um, but our application is free. So as soon as you put that application in, um, if you are a woman going into hockey, you're going to be talking to me. If you're a guy going into hockey, you'll be talking to Jason Dart. So we have two people. So it's a very personalized experience where you know exactly who you need to talk to and we are very well connected with our coaches. So we work together as a team to make sure that you guys have everything you need to get through that process. When it comes to scholarships and affording college, um, we do actually have some really great scholarships for transfer students. Um, the biggest one being our Finish Strong Scholarship, which is $10,000. And that is actually awarded to students with six or more college transferable credits. Um, an average new student starts out with at least $5,000 in scholarships and goes up from there. And then Canadian students actually benefit from the exchange rate. So you will actually be paying the tuition in Canadian dollars versus US dollars, which is gonna cut down your cost by three to $4,000, depending on what the current exchange rate is. Um, and on top of that, we don't limit your scholarships, even though you're getting that um, kind of special you know, cost rate, you're still gonna get the same scholarships as any other student would. So that wraps up my admissions part. Um, that was brief. I tried to give you guys as much information um, you know, in this small time that we had. So of course, if you want more info, um, reach out and let us know. We're more than happy to talk to you. But I'm gonna let Lindsay take over and talk to you a little bit more about our hockey programs. Right on. Thank you, Lauren. Holy cow, good job. So I have to follow that up. That's kind of crazy. So I am the women's hockey coach at Finlandia. So I'm going to talk a little more about my program, but the men's program pretty much runs um, the same as we do. And then we also have an ACHA Division II men's club program. So um, we have three hockey programs right on campus. All of us do, we do pretty well. We have a lot of fun. Coaches are great. Um, we, the men's and the women's NCAA team play in the Northern Collegiate Hockey Association. That's our conference. Um, and it pretty much just runs right around Lake Michigan or all the schools. And then there's, there's us up in the UP, as you guys saw from Lauren's presentation. Um, we play 27 games a season. Typically, we are playing on the weekends, which leaves us um, like a Monday through Thursday practice schedule. So we're practicing four to five times a week for an hour to an hour and a half. Um, and then just recently we got with the club team in the men's program and we are actually running skill sessions two to three days a week. Um, and then we're gonna do goalie worlds one to two days a week, just depending on ice time. Um, unfortunately, our rink is not on campus, but it's only like two minutes from campus. So it's super easy, super easy to get to. Um, and we actually have our own area. So they did an awesome job in the last couple of years and built on a brand new locker rooms, training rooms um, for, for, the, for all three teams. We actually even have saunas in our room because Finlandia is, you know, Finnish. So uh, saunas are super huge in, into that culture. Um, and because we're up in the UP, we actually travel a lot. So the men's coach likes to say it's kind of like the, the pro teams, like they're on the road all the time. 
Um, and so they, they think that's kind of fun to get out and that's where all the camaraderie goes on the buses and, and it builds and is great team chemistry on both the men's and the women's team. Um, we get, so the, the school covers, uh, sweatshirts, like your typical swag, right? So you get sweatshirts, t-shirts, um, shorts, anything for working out. We cover, we cover, um, gear, uh, all your ice time, everything's covered for travel, um, pretty much all you have to do is come show up for school. Then uh, the club team is a little bit different on that. They have to pay a little bit more out of their pocket. But NCAA, pretty much everything is covered. Uh, we have that. You guys saw that w awesome weight room. Like you can't, you can't beat that weight room. And then we all we are one of the few teams in our league that actually has a full time strength and conditioning coach. So both of our programs are working out three to four times a week. Uh, depending on schedule, depending where we're at in the season. And that is with a full-time certified strength and conditioning coach. Yes, that does include goalie gear. So we do get you, we do get you gear, everything, helmet, whatever you need when you get here. Um, so is there something? Yes, Georgia, there is a um, you can email me or you can email Lauren and we can we can help you with that. So um, I think that's about it for our program, unless anybody has any questions. Yeah, Joe Burkar and then Colin Longway are are the the men's, and then Colin is the uh, is the ACHA Division Two coach. Super good dudes, really like them. Fun. The kids, the kids that play for them, love them as well. Very much player coaches. Anybody have any questions? The other thing that's super, I think I should point out, you know, just as a coach is, and I know Lauren, Lauren touched on it, but the amount of academic support at Finlandia is pretty awesome. I, I have had kids that got the professor's professor's cell phone numbers so they can help them with homework, whether that be on the road or just when they're at home. So that's one of the small, the small kind of school um, positives that you get. And then the other thing is, is with uh, Lauren had said, there's two other universities. One is Michigan Tech, which is a, a division one men's program. So the, just the area is just hockey, hockey, hockey. They're just hockey crazy up here. Um, you go. You actually go into a restaurant, and in, in so many of the states is basketball, but up in up in the UP, it's hockey all the time. So I see that we've got a question on cost um, for an average Canadian student. Right now, I have a couple of Canadian students, and they have the transfer scholarship, and they're paying about nineteen thousand, and that does actually include tuition and housing. Um, students without the transfer scholarship, it's generally about the same because we're able to help them find scholarships that usually amount to that. And a lot of my Canadian students tend to have, um, honestly, they tend to have pretty good GPAs, so they get really high entrance scholarships. Um, so that is including the um, rate, the exchange rate, because again, you would actually be paying in Canadian dollars versus in US. US dollars and um, we would base it on the current exchange rate up to 30%, but generally it floats around 18 to 20. And I've got, how do we decide if you get full scholarships or partial? Um, we do not have any scholarships that would necessarily um, give you what would be considered a full ride. Um, you could potentially gain a lot of scholarships to stack on top of each other that could help you, um, you know, basically get to a full ride. Um, and it depends on if you're getting any external scholarships on top of what we've offered you. So you're going to pay. Um, so I see do Canadian students pay domestic rates or international rates. You'll pay in Canadian dollars. So for example, if your balance was like 23,000 or so with uh, US dollars, you'd actually be paying closer to like 19 something. So you are very welcome. Thank you so much. And I can see that the questions are still coming through. So please go ahead and keep those conversations going in the private and the Q&A chat. And thank you so much, Lauren and Lindsay, for the information you shared with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. We're going to keep things rolling and hand the reins over to Concordia University. And we'll keep, they will keep your camera off as well. All right. Um, 
There we go. So we'll pass things over to Kelsey and Chance. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Happy afternoon, you guys. Um, so my name is Kelsey Marcourt. I'm at Concordia University Ann Arbor, and I am the International Admissions Coordinator. So up until your arrival, I am the person you're going to be talking with as far as admissions. Um, so you can see Ann Arbor is the CUAA on that website here. Um, so we are located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And if you know anything about Ann Arbor, you know it's always at the top of the list, right, for number one college towns in the United States. So if you're interested in the number one college town experience, but also having a smaller setting where you can make sure you are individually attended to um, and professors know your name as you walk down hallways, um, then Concordia Ann Arbor may be just the right place for you. So you can see here we have 49 undergraduate programs. I'm gonna to touch on our most popular ones in a little bit, um, but we also have other sports teams, lots of clubs and lots of support. So we have tutoring and writing centers as well as our international center. But you can see we're a smaller university, but again, big town feel. Um, so if we move on here, I know some students and parents are really concerned about how we've been handling COVID. Um, and during the last year, uh, we've been able to remain safe and open by doing lots of very, um, very careful things. One is a daily symptom tra tracker that every student, staff, faculty is required to do. And that little green dot you can see online allows me access into different parts of the university. So without that green dot, students are asked to stay home be safe and we'll follow up with you. Um, and also we can see COVID capacities. We have our daily um, updates on where we're sitting at with COVID cases at our Ann Arbor campus. Um, and moving forward, actually, you may have heard uh, the United States has a lot of vaccinations available. So as we move forward through the school year, we're gonna be more and more looser with those restrictions, but making sure we're staying as safe as possible. Um, as well, something unique about our campus is the res life situation. So you can see in our picture here, they're kind of set up as mini um, apartment buildings. But while the uh, normal dorm life experience is there, there's also that really great common space in each one of the dorms where it has a kitchen and a lounge. Um, so this means if you have a roommate that isn't your best friend, right? Chances are you're gonna be able to find your best friend within your, your building still. But that's a really unique way to make friends. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Chance here to talk a little bit about our uh, hockey programs. Hi, I'm Chance Childers. I'm with our athletic department. I've uh, been working close with our in our enrollment procedures with our hockey, football, track, and the like. And I wanted to touch on some things about our hockey program, both our uh, relatively new programs like in our third year, but we are ACHA Division I. They are not club. So I'll touch on some of the things that are, are similar. Uh, both of our men's and women's hockey teams are coached by former uh, Division I goalies. Our women's coach, Maria Barlow, was a goalie and goalie coach at Michigan State. And uh, our men's coach was at, here in, in, in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. They are uh, fully funded programs. So it comes with the all the sweatshirts and gear and swag, as well as uh, Goalie gear is included, and as well as a full supply of sticks. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. Our, uh, our our arena is also off campus, but we have our own little area in both of them for locker rooms and the like. Uh, also, want to share that uh, our our women's coach Maria Barlow. She was uh, part of uh, Team USA uh, in that the World University Games and. Uh, our men's coach was drafted by the uh, New Jersey Devils, played uh, six years professionally, uh, two in the U.S. and uh, or four in the U.S. and, and two in, in Europe. The biggest thing for us is that uh, both of these coaches have completely bought in to the mission of the university, and that's developing our kids in body, mind, and spirit. And we do that through uh, various servant event projects. They've been partnering up with the Children's Hospital, sweatshirt drives for the homeless, bowls for soup kitchens and things like that. And uh, I think that our, our student athletes have such an enriched experience by being uh, mentored by, uh, by this phenomenal, phenomenal coaching staff. Um, they play a full schedule. And uh, so we're talking like, you know, 30 to, to 20 games and all that. And, uh, 
it's, like I said, it's really been a, a super experience for all of our kids. You'll see that our men's coach was just named coach of the year. Our women's team is an independent of ACHA Division I. And our men's team plays in what is called the WAC, the Wolverine Hoosier Athletic Conference, which is one of the top three uh, conferences in ACHA Division I. So hopefully I get you a little excited about the hockey opportunities here. And then, you know, hopefully we can uh, address any questions any of you might have. Thanks, Chance. Um, yeah, as we move forward, I know some of the, you guys are asking, what are your most popular programs? What do you guys do best besides hockey? Um, because you're not coming just to be an athlete, right? You're a student athlete. Um, so one program that's very popular amongst our undergraduate students is computer science. Um, and I'm not going to go over all of these terms, but you can see they cover a wide array of very um, marketable skills in computer science. Um, our computer science program actually is also a scholars program, which means if you are uh, willing to do some very strenuous um, heavy lifting, not just in sports, but in academics, um, you are able to have an undergrad and graduate degree in computer science in four years at no extra cost. Um, that is a strenuous program, like I said, um, but if you and also has strenuous um, admissions criteria. But if you want to know more about that, I would be happy to, to get you some more information. Then our business program is also very popular. Again, not going to go through all these. Maybe take a picture if you want. Um, but we have lots of uh, different business programs available. Now, these as well are scholars program eligible. So if you are interested, um, you can have an undergrad and an MBA degree in four years at no extra cost. Um, for some, that is something they're really looking for. Um, and if you'd like some more information, I'd be happy to chat with you about it. Um, and then last but not least is our nursing program. So our nursing program is a little unique in that it is kind of housed in its own separate mini hospital. Um, when I'm there, it feels like I've, I've gone into the wrong building and I'm like, do I need to have an appointment? Um, because everybody's wearing scrubs. The um, simulation lab is completely decked out like a hospital would be. Everybody's got their stethoscopes on. Um, and especially in the midst of COVID, this has been extremely valuable for our students. So top of the line simulation lab means they're still getting their hands-on experience um, and having those skills when they enter the workforce when they're very, very needed right now. And that means too that our NCLEX pass rate is above the national average. Um, so some of you may be asking as well, what is the cost of our undergraduate program? So I'm gonna leave this up here, but please note that we do have scholarships available. Um, and I'm gonna move over to those right away. Um, but also as a note, room and board, that is for if you're living on campus, you do not have to live on campus. It is not required um, for our first year students. Um, so if some are looking to save some costs, a lot of them take advantage of being the number one college town in the United States, having access to that great housing and transportation, and that's how they can cut down a lot of costs. Um, so moving on then to scholarships. So we do have undergraduate academic scholarships. Those are going to be based on your GPA. Um, and uh, uh, Jenica talked about that a little bit, but it's also my job to evaluate that for you. Um, and that's going to range based on your GPA. Then athletic scholarships are going to be awarded by the coach. Um, so you can certainly um, talk to Chance about that, about how athletic scholarships are awarded. We have special talent scholarships for those looking at the fine arts and then also a Luther Promise Scholarship. Um, so that is for anybody coming in who is part of a Lutheran congregation. Um, and you can see there's a few more kind of little nitbits um, if to qualify for that Luther Promise Scholarship, um, but it's just part of our identity here at Concordia. Um, and then also a way to kind of help with costs and get some experience on your resume is to work on campus. So we have international students working across the board in the international office, in the advising and the tutor, or excuse me, in the tutoring um, and in the um, in the admissions office doing, you know, guided tours of campus. So there's great ways for you to be involved and get paid. <laughs> um, and then also here we have um, how to apply. So we have our free online application. Um, that is right at applycuaa.cuw.edu. Um, and then to send us your transcripts and diplomas. Um, so no ACT or SAT required for admission, but I heard uh, Janneke talking about how it may be required for your um, eligibility. 
Um, and last but not least here, I'm going to put two links in the chat here. So one is going to be our virtual campus tour. So you can take a look at campus at the comfort of your couch. Um, and then the second one is if you are interested in doing a uh, private one-on-one -on -one international admissions meeting with me, you can schedule that as well to be in the right time for you. It just syncs right up to my calendar. So those are the two uh, links I put there. Okay, I'm gonna scan through the chat, but Chance, were there um, any questions about, about our hockey program? No, I'm just gonna, I was gonna touch base again as you were talking about the uh, number one college town. It's not just that we are five minutes away from Eastern Michigan and five minutes away from U of M, but I think from a, a social, educational, professional opportunities that exist in a, in a college community like we have, our kids have taken advantage of that uh, across all sectors, whether from this little private Christian liberal arts school getting accepted to the School of Pharmacy at U of M or med school at John Hopkins and University of Chicago, they've really taken full advantage of all the opportunities given to them socially, spiritually, and academically. So um, there, there's a reason it's the number one college town in America, and it's not just because we say so. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I did see somebody ask about health sciences undergraduate programs. So I'm going to put in the chat here as well. We have a whole listing of undergraduate health sciences programs. You can check them out there. Um, and then fully paid scholarships. Unfortunately, we do not have any full ride scholarships, they're called, um, at Concordia. So excuse me as I, as I read through some of these other ones here. And uh, average costs are going to vary depending on those scholarships you're awarded based on your academic performance and those athletic scholarships as well. Um, and if you choose to live on and off campus. So there's a lot of variance there. There's a lot of um, ways we can kind of help you fluctuate between making it best the best fit for your budget. Um, so maybe schedule a time with me and we can kind of talk that out uh, a little more. I also saw one on here about how many Canadians we've had and, and the success. Being a new kind of newer startup program, we started up with uh, mostly the local kids. Thankfully, Michigan is a nice uh, hockey community in its surrounding area. And then um, we've, we've had a few, both for men's and women. Some even doubled up and played lacrosse uh, here on campus. But we needed uh, we need to do we need to get more. And that's why we're on here. And um, I saw there's a, a personal chat here to me. I will make sure to answer that, Randy, in the in the private chat. And there was one more question there for you, Chance. How does your team compare with D3 programs from a competitive perspective? I'm not that I'm not in the – I'd never like to – I guess talk down about D three because we get to give athletic scholarships. Um, are, we anticipate it being a, a little bit uh, a higher level. I, I would equate it to football when we started it up. We were on par, and our schedule consisted of a lot of D three teams. And then, you know, eight years in, we are undefeated against Division two teams, and and you know, playing you know, for national championships. It, it, so there's a, a trajectory that we need to get to right now in the infancy stage, probably very similar, but uh, increasing rapidly. Oh, Jenica, you're on mute. Yeah, Jenica's on mute. Sorry about that. Um, so you're part of NAIA, uh, correct? And so that's, and is there, a, is that common? Is there other NAIA kind of ACHA uh, teams? There are, it's, it's again, it's it's an emerging uh, here in our area. Uh, a lot of schools in the WAC, which is uh, our university plays in for all other sports is an NAIA conference. But okay. um, I, in working with our hockey coaches and such, they were like really, NAIA is not going to mean anything to Canadians. They're not really, you know, it's not one of those things they're familiar with. So it's just kind of ACHA Division One that mm -hmm. can give scholarships. So it, it okay. is very close to that. What they would know is NCAA kind of Division Two, lower Division One model. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for the information. Uh, for those of you who still have questions, I see a couple more come through in the chat. Please send those either in the Q&A or private message um, to our friends here from Concordia. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. We're going to keep rolling right along and, um, and hand things over to the team at Riviere University. Hi, Paul. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for having us today. Good to see you. Awesome, and I'll kick, thing off, kick things off. Uh, my name is Paul Brower. I'm the Vice President for Enrollment here at Riviere, and uh, it's been fun as we've started to build out our new men's and women's hockey programs. Um, with me today, I have Dave Bariga, who is, oversees our Office for Global Engagement, and then Eric Sorensen, our men's coach, and Chris Sarnota, our women's coach, uh, both of whom are in their first year of building the program. Uh, I'm gonna take you through some of the academics and whatnot real quick before we let Chris and Eric talk about the fun stuff. Uh, so first, for those of you who do want more information, want to get right into our inquiry base, uh, you can actually send a quick text and you can fill out a form from your cell phone. Only takes about 30 seconds, so you can shoot a text in. We'll get your information and that will allow us to reach out to you much quicker and more efficiently. I will show this again at the end of the presentation, so you'll have another chance at it. All right, so uh, first, you know, we are located in Nashua, New Hampshire. Uh, just about 35 miles north of Boston, Massachusetts, which we all know is the real number one college town in the country, as well as number one hockey town in the country. Uh, so we have the benefits of being located close to Boston, but just tucked right over the New Hampshire border. Uh, the average incoming GPA of our students is just north of a 3.2 on the 4.0 scale. And we have a total enrollment of around 2,300 with uh, you know, roughly 1,100 undergraduate full-time students. Our faculty ratio is uh, right around 13 to one. And with the addition of men's and women's hockey, we do sponsor 15 varsity NCAA Division III sports with over 30 clubs and organizations. Uh, academically, we have over 30 undergraduate majors. Uh, some of our largest programs, we have an unbelievable business program. It's ACBSP accredited, which is a very strong international accreditation. Our nursing program was actually recognized as a top 100 program in the country and the number one private option in New Hampshire. For those of you interested in teaching and counseling, we have one of the strongest overall education programs in the Eastern US, as well as a psychology program that can take you all the way up through a doctorate in psychology. Uh, we feature very, very large programs within nursing and the sciences. So if you're interested in the pre-med, dental, veterinary, or environmental science programs, we can, we can take care of you there. Uh, we do have a tremendous biotech program. And if you look at the actual area around uh, Nashville, New Hampshire, the biotech field is growing very quickly because a lot of top-notch com companies are choosing to relocate to New Hampshire because of the tax base and overall uh, the ability to, to really build more effectively than in suburban Boston. So we have the benefits of being close uh, without actually having to pay the prices and the crazy, crazy costs of being in Boston. And then lastly, we have a tremendous uh, liberal arts program, top to bottom with your more traditional majors. Applying is simple. Uh, it's one form. You can use the Common App or our online. We simply require one letter of recommendation, your high school transcripts. And if you have been attending uh, college in, in Canada, you are allowed to submit your college transcripts as well uh, for transfer credit. And with that, I'm going to give the coaches a few minutes to talk about uh, the hockey programs. And I'm going to throw a couple of links to some videos in the chat for you if anybody wants to take a look around our campus. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. So uh, as Paul has kind of stated here, we are Riviera University. It's a new NCAA Division III program starting play next fall. Uh, we are just about wrapping up the recruiting process just to kind of touch base on some of the questions I've seen from you know folks for previous presentations. Uh, the men's team currently has 32 recruited student athletes. Uh, over a dozen of those are international students, including Canadians uh, and at least one European from the Czech Republic. Uh, why Riviere? Uh, when I go through this recruiting process, I talk to, to my players, and this is what I say, uh, and I, I don't mean to speak for Chris, our women's coach, uh, but I tell them, you know, I came from a top 15 NCAA Division III program in Williams College. Uh, Chris came from a top 15 NCAA uh, program in Norwich University, and for me to leave the situation that I was in and for him to do that, it was because the university had to have a vision. Um, of what they wanted the hockey programs to be. And for me, that was a competitive program on the ice. Um, so far, uh, the university's done a tremendous job 
uh, with the financial backing. Uh, as far as that goes, equipment is, is covered. Uh, we can get in more in depth with that if anyone has questions, but uh, a number of things are covered. Uh, playing at an ice arena that's three miles away or five kilometers away from our campus uh, at a beautiful, relatively new venue. Um, you know, and we're working on making sure we have a permanent home there as well, which is fantastic. Um, so it was that the hockey piece was huge, but it also, and I tell everyone this as well, uh, it had to have a, a good educational background and the programs that we offer, I feel do that. I think it sets folks up, um, not just for the four years that they're here, but the 40 years that they spend 50 years they spend in the workforce beyond. So, um, certainly I feel strongly about that piece. Uh, I also feel that the, the university itself, it's a beautiful campus and the best way I can describe it is it's. It's uh, right next to a country club. We're an hour, a little over an hour away from the ocean. We're an hour from Boston. And if you're someone that likes to get out and go fishing uh, or, or hiking in the mountains or skiing, you can go an hour north of here too. So there was this culmination of things along with our leadership, uh, Paul Brower, our athletic director, Joanne Merrill, our president, Sister Paula, uh, that I think brought me here uh, and got me excited to start a program. Um, and, and again, doing so, and leaving the programs that I was at and Chris was at, um, we've been striving to put together something incredibly competitive. I feel very positive and very excited about the direction recruiting's going um, and, and just continuing to do that. I think we offer tremendous packages. Paul and his staff have done a fantastic job uh, catering, not just to our American students, but our international students, which is evidenced by the international presence we have on both rosters so far. Uh, I'll let Chris kind of speak here in a second, uh, but I can say, and I'll throw my email in the chat as well. Um, the best way to learn more about Riviere, Riviere Hockey, who I am as a coach, who Chris is as a coach, is, is to reach out to us directly uh, via email. So I'll let Chris kind of speak here briefly, and I'll throw my email in the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Arnota. Um, this is my first year at Riviere and couldn't be more excited, as Eric said. Um, my former employer, we had won a national championship at the Division Three level with our women's program about three years ago. Um, and for me to take the leap from there to here was um, a pretty easy decision for me once I got onto campus at Riviere and I met all the people that work at the university that are contributing to what we are doing here at hockey um, or with hockey, I should say. We're super excited, not only hockey, but the school itself is growing. Paul had shown a, a quick little um, picture of the science building that they just finished up and opened in August and it's beautiful. I talked to all my recruits and I said, hey, like when, when you're on campus and we go into the science building, like you basically just say inside your head, like this is college. There's this big open lobby area, these huge monitors on the wall, big fireplace, students out studying, socializing. They've got their laptops. They've got their hydro flasks. It's just, it's college and it's beautiful. And it's, it's just a quick glimpse of what Riviere is quickly becoming. And Eric and I are both super excited to be a part of that. Um, in terms of hockey on the women's side, just like the men's, we're a fully funded program. Um, we've, we're actually getting ready to place our gear order here pretty soon. So, you know, since we're a new program, we're, we are getting everything from head to toe, brand new jersey, socks, helmets, pants, you name it, gloves, sticks, all that good stuff, all the fun stuff. Um, so we're super excited about that. But even more so for me and Eric is the culture that we want to bring is we want to piggyback off the Riviere vision um, to, to make our programs a program, a hockey program. And if we go a little more into the specifics is each one of our teams, we want to make those teams a family. Eric wants to have his team be a family. I want my team to be a family. Um, and there's already pieces and steps being put into place <clears throat> as we speak. Um, we've got about 23 female players committed to play women's hockey next year. And of those 23, <clears throat> excuse me, They've got a big group chat going on. Um, we've got scheduled Zoom calls over the summer. Um, we're doing a lot of interacting as much as we can um, to start to build the foundation of our team culture. And we're really excited about that. Um, so to get a little bit away from hockey, the academics, as Paul spoke about briefly, are top notch. Um, 
you're, you're, there's such a wide variance of what you could do at Riviera and there's no bad choice. And it's such a great place to be a part of because there's so many different majors and so many different students that it's really a fully full bodied experience where you are. Because again, you can go up to the lakes and the beach within an hour, or you can be in the city of Boston within an hour. And it's a really cool environment and you walk on campus and it's such a, such a community type feeling. Um, it's something that I think small schools do it the best because we are a little bit closer at, you know, in a sense, and it's just really exciting for everything that Riv is, is getting ready to do. But, um, I'll put my email in the chat too. I would love to talk to, to any, um, players that are considering playing NCAA division three hockey. Um, any questions, comments, please don't hesitate to reach out. We can always schedule a, a phone call or a zoom call. I'm pretty flexible. So look forward to hearing from any of you. And we did have a quick question about now uh, when students should begin applying. Students generally want to have completed the equivalent of their 11th grade. Uh, so really about a year before you're going to be enrolling, you can start the application process. Uh, this past year, Riviera un unveiled the Riviera Early Acceptance Program that allows you to visit campus over the summer through the early fall, submit your application in advance, uh, bring a transcript with you, and then in lieu of submitting your recommendations and essay, you'll actually do a brief uh, interview with a member of our team and we can admit you on the spot. So it's a great way to you know, get to see campus, visit with the coaches, but also take care of your entire application in, in one quick visit. And there are some special financial incentives. I know that this year, for example, students are, who participated in the REAP program, they did receive an additional $2,000 in total aid. Uh, and that's on top of merit awards that, that range as high as $20,000. So it's a great way to, to get the process started early and, and knock it out in a fun way uh, that allows you to maximize your visit and, and know you have an answer and even have rough numbers as far as your core costs when you depart campus. Uh, so it's a unique program. And as a special bonus, you are allowed the summer before you arrive on campus to enroll in a three credit online course at no charge so that you can get ahead in your education. And for those of you who are playing, you know, competitive hockey, it's important, you know, having that extra three credits and that class taken care of in advance gives you greater flexibility as far as scheduling and your overall academic program, which can help, you know, down the road as you're looking to intern or at other experiential learning opportunities. Anything else as far as questions or things that we can help you with? And you can see, just kind of quickly again, if you are interested in uh, working through the uh, the actual admissions office, you can simply shoot us a quick text. We'll have all your information. We'll be happy to get back to you. Uh, I will, you know, throw some of the video links into the chat as we wrap up here. Um, we get ready for, I believe, Merrimax coming on next. Lastly, there's the, the emails. If you need to get a hold of any of us, we're happy to help. Uh, good luck in your search, and we, we hope to have the opportunity to hear from you very soon. I did see a question. It looks like about health sciences. Health sciences is one of our largest overall programs. Anything in medical, nursing, or sciences, uh, that's our wheelhouse. So thank you very much. Best wishes, everyone. And I'll add some of those materials to the, uh, the chat momentarily. Awesome. Thank you so much, Riviere team. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Thank you all. Awesome. Well, um, as we as we move right along, our next university is the University of Vermont. I do want to remind you that we have been putting things in the handout section. I put a lot of NCAA documents in that area. Um, so that might be useful as supplementary information for the next uh, upcoming sessions here. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Liz. Great, thank you so much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Liz hamlin Voles, and I'm one of the senior assistant directors here at the University of Vermont in the admissions office. And I work with both our domestic students as well as our students from Canada. And I also have Jeff Schulman, who is our director of athletics, who will be joining me in the second half of the presentation in our 15 minutes. And I just wanted to start off with a beautiful picture of the University of Vermont campus, uh, which you see in front of you, and then Burlington in the background 
and Lake Champlain in the distance. And so we are lucky to be again in a beautiful college town. I'm laughing between all of us talking about Ann Arbor and uh, Riviere and everywhere that we've, we've talked about so far. So um, we are located in Burlington, Vermont, which is about 90 miles south of Montreal, about a six hour drive to Toronto and about three and a half hours away from Boston, about a one hour flight to New York City. We're lucky that Burlington does have an airport about three miles away from campus. So depending on where you're coming from in Canada, you can easily access us through the Burlington airport or through the Montreal airport and then cross the border there. And so Burlington itself is a small city in the state of Vermont. Um, we again are in the northwestern corner of, of the New England area. And it's a small city, but it's the largest city in the state of Vermont. We have 10,000 undergraduate students and our students are coming from 48 states typically and about 60 different countries. So your conversations in the classroom as well as uh, just on your team and in your classroom and clubs and organizations that you join will be that much richer because of the international students and where students are coming from all across the country. Our international population is about 6%. All right, so just to talk a little bit about the academic options that are available to you at UVM, um, over 100 different majors, and they're all kind of housed in these seven undergraduate schools and colleges. So as you apply into the university, we're gonna ask you to put down a first choice academic major in one of these different schools and colleges, and that's really gonna become the starting point and the academic home um, as you begin your work at the university. It doesn't mean you can't change your mind as you go through, many times students will do that. And many of our popular majors are things in the biological and neuroscience and health sciences area, College of Nursing, as you can see, business and economics is a very popular area, as well as our STEM fields. Um, environmental science, the state of Vermont and UVM really pay attention closely to the environment and there's over 22 different ways that you can study the environment. And then psychological sciences is a really popular liberal arts and science major. Many of our students will also continue on one year after UVM and do an accelerated master's program. Now our faculty members that are gonna be really your guides within this academic experience are folks who are leading scholars, they are people that are doing research and they're also balancing their time as um, faculty members at the university. And so what the, you're going to be able to do is really have this benefit of getting to know them and be able to potentially work with them in research. Some of the things about UVM are a little bit different. We are old and new. We were founded in 1791, but our campus is made up of some beautiful architectural buildings and also renovated on the inside, obviously, and new majors and new buildings like our STEM facility that are keeping up with the 21st century. Now, the campus itself size-wise, as I mentioned, is 10,000 students at the undergraduate level. And this will be a, you know, something that you're not going to know everyone, but with your team, as well as the academic major, and also the uh, areas within your clubs and organizations and your residence hall, you're gonna find that you're gonna find these smaller communities that kind of continue to bump into each other. And then the urban part is really kind of a, a joke because in the sense of Burlington being urban, it's not so much just a small town. And then once you you know leave the confines of the town of Burlington, you're really out in some beautiful recreational areas outside of, of the city, getting able to ski or hike within 30 to 40 minutes. And the um, city of Burlington itself is just also a really great uh, music and arts and also great for internships. So I think you'll find a lot of opportunities as your student experience continues on. So when we have our students who are involved in uh, their academic classroom, they're also very much involved in doing high impact practices that really allow them to take what they've been learning in the class and put it in directly into their day-to-day um, -day work. So whether it's an internship, there are over 10,000 of them to choose from, um, doing undergraduate research with the faculty that I mentioned, about 40% of our students will do some form of uh, research, and then service learning courses, as well as studying abroad. All of these opportunities really allow you to take what you've been learning, put it into practice, and again, sometimes see if it's what you really like, and other times continue on going forward. The Career Center and our faculty members are the ones who are gonna really be able to help you navigate and squeeze everything that you can out of your four years at UVM. Residentially, uh, we do have you live on campus for the first two years, and then after that, you can make a decision to move into one of the areas around the campus, which provide either apartment-style housing or houses that have been kind of remanaged into um, smaller apartments. Now, the learning communities on campus are themed, 
And what we know is that students who are provided this opportunity to choose one of these themes that you see on your um, screen really connect at a higher rate. Um, and it also, I think, you know, you're going to have time to be part of your hockey team, but you might want to know other people outside of your academic major. And this is a way of getting to have that experience, allowing yourself to know um, other people and really make your time at UVM that much richer. So one of the things that we also really value on the UVM campus as part of our community is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, some of the common themes that we as faculty, staff, and students really uphold are our uh, common ground, which is really our value statement. And it's something that you will begin and join in and pledge to do as part of your time at UVM as a student the very first weekend. Um, we also have a number of different campus identity centers that are really a place for students to kind of celebrate their different identities, as well as learn more about them and kind of call a second home. And our educational requirements also include two courses in diversity, one in sustainability, one in quantitative reasoning and foundational writing and information literacy. So what we want to make sure is by the time you're graduating from UVM, that you're going to be an informed citizen of the world. Now, it all kind of starts with you seeing yourself at the University of Vermont. And we hope that, you know, this has been a very short program. I encourage you, and I'll put some links into the chat of virtual tours and different virtual opportunities for you to take advantage. And we're talking about some of the uh, in-person opportunities for visiting campus this summer. But it all starts with seeing yourself here, joining our mailing list, and then thinking about maybe how the requirements for admission might correlate to what you've been able to do. And so I'll encourage you to look at our website um, and I'll put that in the, the comments as well. Now we do a holistic review of our application. So everything that's part of your application is what we're going to be looking at. That does take the form of transcripts, looking at the rigor, what's been available to you in your own particular high school setting. And we'll also, if your English is not your first language, we'll also look at an English proficiency test. Um, the SATs or ACTs have been optional for our international students for a couple of years. However, for domestic students for this year, a fall of 2022, and for fall of 2023, it also is going to be an option. So that doesn't mean you don't have to take them. It does mean if you feel like you did take them and you have the opportunity and you feel like your scores are strong and would supplement your application, then go ahead and send them. But there is no requirement to do that. And there are also optional interviews. And again, I'll be available to help chat with you about questions. Uh, one of the other things that at the time of your admissions decision, we are also looking at your application for merit-based scholarships, looking at your academic performance, and then also for entrance into the Honors College. So a lot of information there. I'll put some information in the chat and I will pass it over to Jeff. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, it, uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be with you all and to share a little bit of uh, information and background, background about uh, hockey at, at the University of Vermont. Um, my name is Jeff Schulman. I'm the director of athletics at UVM. Um, I have a long history at the university. It's my fifth year as athletic director, but I've actually worked uh, in the athletic department since 1993, um, probably well before any of the students that are that are on this call uh, were born. Maybe everybody's on this call. Um, and uh, before that, I was a student at UVM. I was uh, graduated from UVM in 1989. I was a political science major, um, and I spent four years as a member of the, um, the varsity ice hockey team. And um, it, uh, I, I had uh, some of you may be able to re to relate to my role on the team. I was what they call a, a stay-at-home defenseman. Um, which, uh, as many of you probably know, is sort of code for I was a defenseman who didn't score a whole lot, but um, had a, had a great experience as a student athlete at UVM. I was drafted by the Boston Bruins after I after I graduated and uh, decided not to ride the buses around the minor leagues after that, and um, got a job and and obviously got into athletic administration. So, um, in terms of uh, hockey at, at UVM, make sure I can advance these. Um, so the, there's actually multiple opportunities for students to get involved. Obviously, the highest level are NCAA Division I men's and women's programs. Both of those teams play in Hockey East, which is a uh, uh, we like to think is the most competitive Division I uh, hockey conference in the country. Uh, if you follow college hockey closely, you know that one of the Hockey East teams on the men's side won the national championship just about a month ago. It's U UMass Amherst on the women's side, Northeastern University which is a hockey school, um, got to the, the NCAA championship game and lost a heartbreaker in overtime. But um, it's a very high level of hockey. We have 
18 scholarships in, in both our men's and women's programs. Oftentimes, those are broken up and awarded to students in, in partial scholarships, oftentimes coupled with other academic uh, merit awards. Um, and the students that are that are playing in our on our teams um, have played a really serious elite level of hockey all through uh, their youth um, youth sports, uh, and um, oftentimes at prep schools or serious junior hockey teams or on uh, club teams on on the women's side. Um, and they come here and oftentimes want to pursue hockey beyond college as well. Several of our players go on to play professionally on both the men's and women's side and participate in international competitions as well. Um, I'm happy to happy to answer more questions about that. We have a, a really nice mix of, of uh, U.S. and Canadian players on both our men's and women's teams, as well as other international players from from Europe. Um, and uh, and and both teams are, are very highly competitive. We just hired a new uh, men's coach this past year, a gentleman by the name of Todd Woodcroft, who uh, was with the Winnipeg Jets before he uh, came to UVM. So it's a um, great NHL background. Um, men's and women's club hockey is also available for serious players. Um, most of our players in our men's and women's club teams have played a high level of high school hockey before they come to Vermont and they still want an opportunity to, to stay competitive. And um, they typically play between 20 and, and 25 games a year against other colleges and universities around, uh, around the Northeast. They both compete in ACHA Division II. Um, do you want to leave time for questions? So I'll go go through the rest of this pretty quickly. A couple things that are really special about our program: we play in one of the most exciting college hockey venues in the country, Gutterson Fieldhouse. What we call the Gut uh, is really an incredible place to play and and to watch a game. It seats four thousand. Uh, we sell out almost all of our men's games. Our women's team is, is one of the highest attendance in hockey East year in year out. Uh, we don't have football in Vermont, so the students really rally around around the hockey games. We've got a great student section, a pep band, and just all the energy and spirit that, that makes college hockey so special is, is on display at, at the gut. Um, and then we've got a great history and tradition. You can see uh, this poster of Stanley Cup champions. I think we've had three former men's players that have won the Stanley Cup, including Marty St. Louis, if you see him down there in the bottom right. Uh, Patrick Sharp is on that list, John LeClaire, Tim Thomas, Eric Perrin, Victor Stahlberg, uh, the picture on the bottom uh, is St. Louis and Sharp after they won a gold medal at the Olympics. And then the one at the top right is one of our former women's players, Amanda Pelkey, who uh, played for Team USA in the Olympics. We've also had several uh, other international players that have played in world championships and Olympics. Um, academics is very much a part of our DNA in athletics. Our student athletes exceed the GPA of the student body. Um, you can see 27 out of the last 30 semesters are our athletic GPA last fall was 3.42, and you can see our graduation rate was one of the, the best in all of uh, Division I. Um, we're under construction on a, on a fantastic uh, renovation of the gut and a brand new basketball facility. You can see the groundbreaking, and this is our uh, this is the artist rendering of that facility. So I'll stop there, and uh, obviously happy to answer any questions. Again, thanks for thanks for being on here. I'm happy to happy to be with you all. Um, I see a question there about have we had any players who've competed in the World Juniors? Yes, I think we have two or three players coming next year on the men's side uh, who are in World Juniors. One from Germany, one from Kazakhstan. Um, we've also had U.S. players. John LeClaire was a teammate of mine, played in the World Juniors. I'm not sure about Sharp, but we've definitely had several uh, players over the years that have, that have played in the, in the World Juniors. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'm going to put my email in, in here and then we can, I'll put in some of the coach information for both of the teams and you can follow up. What leagues do you scout in Canada? Here's some coming in quickly. Jeff. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, on the men's side, uh, they're typically looking at um, there's the USHL, which is in the States, um, the BC Junior League, the Alberta Junior League, the Ontario Junior League. So, so the the um, n not major junior, you've probably gone over this already, that major junior, uh, if you play major junior, not eligible to compete in NCAA. On the women's side, it's all of the, the top uh, U19 clubs uh, around Canada um, that are, are 
coaches are, are watching all the time. It's a unique time right now, given that the border's closed. Uh, so it's it's the recruiting landscape is really challenged right now. But certainly reach out to our coaches if you're interested, and they'll they'll get back to you. Um, the age issue um, on the men's side, uh, college hockey has gotten very old, especially at the division at all levels, really. I think the average age, and I'm sorry if this is redundant. I think the average age of a college hockey freshman right now is is like 20.6 years old. I read this the other day. So um, they're, they're typically completing high school and then going and playing junior hockey before they uh, before they come to Division One. All right. Well, we've got to turn it over to the next team, but I see you all have a lot of questions. Please make sure to use the private in the Q&A chat to keep asking those questions um, to the University of Vermont. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, and thank you. Um, thank you, Liz. Thank you, Jeffrey. And we are going to hand things over to our next institution, um, Marymount College. Rachel, are you uh, on? Yes. Wonderful. Perfect. All right. All right. Thank you so it. much. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Tamponi. I am the Associate Director of Admission and International Recruitment at Merrimack. Um, so if you are applying, I'll be the one that works with you through the whole process as an international student coming to study in the United States. I also work really closely with our athletic office, so both of our men and women's ice hockey coaching staff. Um, so if you are applying, I'll also be helping you through that whole process. Um, unfortunately, they couldn't join us today. It is our undergraduate commencement. It is in person, so very exciting. So they did want to see their seniors um, walk across the stage. So to kick it off, I'm going to give everyone just a little bit of information about Merrimack. Um, I like to start with a visual. So Merrimack College is located just about 30 minutes north of Boston. So another shout out to Boston. There's a lot of good college towns in the room, but Boston is a wonderful educational opportunity for students, big student town, um, lots to do. So we are suburbanly located just outside of the city. Uh, there is a commuter rail that takes you right downtown. You can get right into North Station um, where the Bruins play. So very easy access to the city, but you still have that kind of community vibe. You can walk from one side of campus to the other um, in about 15 to 20 minutes. So everything is all in one place for our students. Um, as far as what is around us, I mentioned Boston, but we are located just about 30 minutes from the beach, so we are pretty coastal. We're also located within driving distance from the mountains, so we have ski and snowboard club. So you get kind of the best of both worlds, lots of outdoor opportunities. Um, we're also about four hours from New York for those who aren't familiar with the area. And then a little more about Merrimack. Um, we have about 4,000 undergraduate students, about 1,200 grad students. So we are growing in size over the past few years, one of the fastest growing institutions in the nation. But while we grow, um, we stay true to that small school feel, that individual personalized attention and support that our students know and love. Uh, it is a 15 to one student faculty ratio. So no huge lecture halls. Um, all of your faculty will know your name. We don't use TAs to teach any of our classes. So they'll really know you and have a vested interest in you, your academic, in your future career. Uh, we have over 100 different academic programs to choose from. So kind of small liberal art core education with big academic opportunities. We have everything from business to a better credit engineering programs um, to all of the typical hard sciences. We have health sciences, athletic training. We have a great nursing program. We have brand new academic space for many of our buildings, new residence halls on campus. Uh, we also have the School of Ed and Social Policy. And then we have over 30 different liberal art programs to choose from. Um, very custom customizable. You can major in minor, you can double major in different disciplines, you can combine programs, you can even self-design your major. So lots of options. Um, we have over 60 different student-run clubs and organizations. So everything from academic-based groups to interest-based groups. Um, we encourage all students to get involved. We have a big involvement fair at the start of every semester. So we say, you know, get out there and sign up for a few things. It's a great way to make friends. Um, if you are going to be playing in athletic leagues, also another really great way to have kind of that built-in connection on campus. Uh, we have a pretty even 50-50 male-female ratio. We do have students coming from 34 different states and 35 different countries as of last year. So we are actively recruiting students from around the world to really try to give our students um, more of a global education. Uh, Merrimack was founded in 1947 by the Order of St. Augustine. We are an Augustinian Catholic institution. We are one of two in the United States. Um, our sister school is Villanova, located down in Pennsylvania. So really contemporary Catholic, um, really focused on the mission of service, leadership, pursuit of knowledge and truth, giving back to others. So we have a really um, kind, caring community um, of a student body. 
we have Division One athletics. Um, so just like UVM, we are also in the Hockey East. So that is for both our men and women's hockey programs. Um, then if you are interested in other athletic programs, we actually just made the exciting move to the Division One level. Uh, so we now compete in the Northeast Conference for all of our non-hockey programs. Um, but the Hockey East is definitely kind of one of the premier in the United States. Um, definitely a lot of big, big hockey schools. So Merrimack has that wonderful hockey vibe. Um, another thing I like to talk about is we're very career focused. So, um, you know, athletics is great and you can definitely take it far. You can take it beyond. We have students that go pro all the time, but you end of the day, your education is important. Your future career, the outcomes are important. Um, so Merrimack is very career focused. Um, the way that we do that is all of our students have a dedicated career advisor. They also have a dedicated student success coach and they also have their academic advisor. So you have a trio of people that are helping you, looking out for you. Um, your career coach is school specific. So if you are a business major, you're gonna have a business school career coach. So they're gonna work with you from start to finish on everything from resume building to to getting co-ops and internships, um, to salary negotiation, you know, when you get your first job offer. So start to finish, they really make sure to help you out so you're in a good position to get a job. 86% um, of students take part in at least one co-op or internship. We're now guaranteeing that for every single new student uh, because building that resume is so important. Um, thinking about outcomes within nine months of graduation, 96% of our students are full-time employed or in grad school. And then looking long-term return on investment, 10 years out, Merrimack grads are making 60% higher than the national average. And then just a little bit about the application. Um, we are on the Common App or we have our own application. Either option is totally fine. There's no fee to apply, so it is completely free. We will take a look at your high school transcript. Um, being in Canada, totally fine to send it as is. Um, we do ask that it is in English. Um, so that is the only real requirement, but we look at the strength of the classes you're taking. We'll give you additional weight for any higher level courses. Uh, we require a school report and at least one letter of recommendation. Um, Merrimack itself is fully test optional, so test scores are not required for admission or scholarship. But again, monitor if you are going to be um, an NCAA recruit, they may or may not require test scores in future years. So that's something to, to stay in, in consideration for. Um, we have rolling admissions, so you can really apply whenever you feel comfortable. Um, the earlier you wanna hear back, apply early. If you wanna take your time, feel free to take your time. Um, we do review applications all through the summer, so there's no stress in the process um, for our students. So moving a bit um, on to ice hockey. So our men's ice hockey team was established in 1954. Scott Bork is our head coach. Um, he comes to Merrimack. He's been here for about two and a half years now. He brings over 35 years of college, college hockey um, coaching experience. So um, lots of knowledge in the coaching staff. Um, I mentioned we are division one. We are in the hockey east. Um, the Laurel Rink is our home arena. Uh, as far as Canadian students on our hockey team, we do currently have eight on the roster and we always have kind of a, a steady flow of um, students coming from the US, from Canada, um, from many of the Nordic countries. So it is kind of a real melting pot and a really great way to meet students from around the world, from all over. Um, Moving on, we also have a women's team. So our women's team is fairly new. They were established in 2013. Um, Erin Hamlin is our head coach. So Erin has um, so much hockey knowledge and wisdom. Um, she was a starting goalie for the women's U.S. national team. Um, she was named player of the year. She was also the first coach of the Boston Blades who played in the Women's Canadian Hockey League. Um, so lots of great experience from Erin. Um, they're also in the Hockey East. The photo that I have on the right in the middle, um, that was actually a game where they played against Quinnipiac in Ireland. So really cool opportunities to kind of travel, have some friendly games in other countries, um, really giving those students that experience. Something to note about our men and women's ice hockey teams, um, it is still very much academics first. So our hockey players have won um, many awards for the academic achievement. Um, their GPAs are actually higher than um, GPAs of students in our traditional student body. So they definitely make sure students are getting everything, you know, on the rink, but also in the classroom. And then moving on, um, I added some photos just of the facilities. 
Uh, Merrimack is quite fortunate in that we do have two full-size hockey rinks right directly on our campus. They are all housed um, within one giant building, um, so there's lots of ice time available, which is fantastic. Um, so we do have the you know Division One teams. We also do have very competitive club teams for men and women. We do have a big hockey draw, so even the club teams do require tryouts. So there's lots of opportunities, you know, to get ice time to play at Merrimack. Um, I included some photos of the locker rooms, um, the lounge. We do have a newly renovated gym for athletes, um, so that is all a really new space for our students. And then I did just want to put a little more information. I know we talked about some of this earlier, so I won't be redundant, but just if you're thinking about the recruiting process, where you are in the timeline, um, the NCAA Division I recruiting cycle will return to normal June 1st. Um, some things you can hear kind of before you get there, the early recruiting, be thinking of things like tournaments, um, showcases, really any opportunity, hockey combines, where you can get out there and you can play, um, you know, as borders and things reopen, coaches will be out and recruiting, even if they can't start talking to you, they are able to watch games, so you will see coaches in the stand. Um, D1 recruiting can begin January 1st of your sophomore year. So that's when communication can start with coaches. Verbal offers can be extended. You can make unofficial visits to campus. Uh, official visits to campus can start August 1st of your junior year. And then the National Signing Day period starts in early November, goes through early August. Um, and that's when we talked about the, the National Letter of Intent and kind of locking in those intentions. Uh, things to be thinking about in the recruiting process. Um, many of our students do play junior hockey. There are many tiers of junior hockey, so it's a great opportunity. I know we talked about the ages of students getting older, so we do have a lot of students that will apply and potentially defer admission at the advice of the coach to, to play a year or two of juniors, so that's very common. Um, another thing to be thinking about is how you showcase yourself to coaches. Um, there is obviously the in-person opportunities, but where those may be more limited, travel is more difficult. Um, definitely be thinking about tape. Um, so whether you're using you know, YouTube or kind of having someone film you in your games, um, that would be important. Um, most schools do have recruitment forms. I did put a QR code here for Merrimax recruitment form. So if you're interested, you can fill that out, upload any videos you have that information goes to the coaches so when it comes time to start talking to to recruits um, they can be in touch if they have interest and needs in that particular position um, and then also I just want to highlight the importance of academics in the process um, we do give you know athletic scholarships we can stack merit-based scholarships um, for academics for that so really great opportunities um, you know for students to get a lot off and depending on where you go some schools are more competitive um, at Merrimack our average GPA is about a 3.2 out of a 4.0 so students coming in still do need to meet our admission requirements and in other schools may have even more stringent admission requirements so it's important to keep your academics up if you are interested in pursuing you know D1 um, varsity hockey career. So that is all I have for information, but feel free to pop any questions in and I will answer those. Um, do players get additional ice time um, besides scheduled practices? Um, so yes, they they will get um, plenty of ice time. They have about four practices a week. They also do off ice training. Um, so there's lots of ice time at Merrimack, especially where we do have the two rinks available. And then how do you know who to scout in hockey? So definitely a question that the coaches will answer, but essentially it's getting on their radar. Um, it's playing at the big tournaments. They're all watching. Um, they talk to each other. And it's also filling out the recruitment forms and having the right um, tape. So if they can't see you, they can at least watch a tape and see you play um, electronically. So that's another great option. And then as far as scholarships, um, there is an equivalency in Division I, so coaches have so much money that they can spend. Um, in D1 hockey, it is, it is quite a bit. So most international students that I work with um, are getting full scholarships. So that is tuition, fees, room, board, everything um, would be covered both for the men and women's teams. We do also have partial scholarships available, but typically for international recruits, um, those are full scholarships. All right, it looks like that wraps up the questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Clarkson, but if anyone has more questions for me, feel free to toss them in the chat or the Q&A and, and I'll get back to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Yeah, Rachel, stick around so she can continue to answer questions from Mary Mack. Um, I realized that um, I completely forgot to put up Riviere's pop-up earlier. So I wanna make sure that um, if you didn't get a chance, 
Uh, you can also, I, I just put up, um, so there's there's Riviere. And if for any reason you have pop-ups kind of sticking on your screen, the X should always be in the upper right-hand corner. So um, even if it's like on a darker background, you should be able to click there. And if for any reason it's not going away, um, you can always just quickly log out and log back in. A couple people told me they had an issue with that. All right, our friends at Clarkson should be jumping on to camera now. Here we are. All right, I'll hand it over to you, Carrie. Awesome, thank you so much. Hi everybody, my name is Carrie Labar. I am in the admissions office here at Clarkson University. I'm joined by our head men's hockey coach right there. There's Casey Jones. I'm gonna chat a little bit about Clarkson, our campus and the university, and then I'll pass it off. All the hockey knowledge is gonna go to him. So where in the world is Clarkson University? You may be asking yourself, where is Potsdam, New York? So Potsdam, New York is 20 miles south of the U.S.-Canadian border. So once you hit the border, we're approximately one hour south of Ottawa, and we're roughly about two hours southwest of Montreal, Quebec. Um, we are 3,300 or so undergraduate students, and over 90% of our students do live on campus all four years, hence why you see all those residence halls there on our screen. Um, this picture was actually taken in November, so some of the fall foliage is still there, but it looks like quite a bit of it had um, fallen off the trees already. We're just north of the Adirondack Park where we are, so we tend to have a lot of the kind of stereotypical outdoorsy type students on our campus. Uh, we do have a group, the Outing Club, it is the largest we have on campus, and one of their big goals during their four years here at Clarkson is that they want to be able to climb all 46 peaks of the Adirondack Park, and you know what? A lot of them are able to do it. Um, I mean, it's just, a, it's just a really great story built to everybody. Hey, I've climbed all 46 peaks. So make sure you check that out. All right, I'm gonna click over the next one here. So here's a little bit about Admissions 101. We're on the Common App or we have our own Clarkson application. Both of them are free to apply. And we are not a ruling decision. We are either an early decision, which is binding um, decision, or you can do regular decision. That's January 15th. So in your application, we are going to need at least two letters of recommendation and your official high school transcript. Optional for students right now who are going to be entering their senior year, we are SAT or ACT optional for those students. Um, we do require the TOEFL for Canadian students. However, nine times out of 10, we can waive that. Uh, so just reach out to our international counselor. Her name is Colleen and she'll be able to let you know exactly what we need to be able to waive that requirement. Our application timeline, so early decision, if you apply early decision, you will find out before the new year if you have been admitted to Clarkson. Roughly about two weeks after that, you will get your scholarship information as well. If you apply regular decision at Clarkson, you will find out the first week of February, and then you also get your scholarship information roughly about two to three weeks after that as well. For scholarships, we do merit-based aid, and that is available for our international students as well. When you apply to Clarkson, you're automatically in the running for all of that merit-based aid. I promise no extra essay is required. So with our majors, Clarkson is mostly known as an engineering university. 60% of our students fall within that Coulter School of Engineering. The most popular major on our campus is mechanical engineering, followed by aeronautical engineering. Second most popular group is the School of Business. So all of those students, they actually come in and start their own business on our campus. So they write up a business plan as a group, they'll present it in front of a board of investors, think Shark Tank, and then they'll go ahead and run that business their second semester on campus. They also have an international experience that's required with the School of Business as well. So those students can go anywhere during the summer that we have prospects with you. Also, if you wanted to do a full semester, if you're not one of our Division I athletes, you can do that as well. That's a 15-week trip. We also have the Institute for Sustainable Environment on campus, and we do have a School of Arts and Sciences. The largest major out of that group is the biology major. Um, super, super popular right now, though, is data science. So if you're big on math and kind of looking at the big forecasting trends in business, data science would be a good one to look at. Mathematics is also a growing major on campus, and so is applied mathematics and statistics if you are thinking those lines. Also still deciding, you don't need to know what you wanna major in to apply to Clarkson University. All you need to know is you think maybe you wanna do engineering, maybe business, maybe liberal arts, maybe sciences, 
or be completely undecided, and we call that university studies on our campus. When you apply, you're not applying directly into a major. You're not even applying into one of the different schools. You're just applying to Clarkson overall. So I promise if you have no idea what you want to study right now, it is A-OK. -okay. You are not behind at all. So no pressure on really figuring out exactly what you want to do just yet. So just a little life as a golden knight. That is our mascot here at Clarkson University. We do have over 200 clubs on campus to choose from. Again, earlier I'd mentioned the outing club is the largest, um, but we have tons. They range from academic, the speed teams, which are the student projects in experiential engineering and design. We have ones that are a club that are affiliated with some of the sports teams. So for example, we have lacrosse. We also have club lacrosse. We have soccer at Division Three. We also have a soccer at club as well. Greek life we do have on campus. Um, it's not huge on our campus. It's roughly about 15% of our student body that's involved in Greek life, but we do have nine fraternities and three sororities on campus. We have tons of leadership opportunities for our students as well. So if you want to be part of the student union that helps run all of the clubs and their budgets, you can be part of the student group there. You also could be a residence hall um, advisor if you wanted to, a great way to get leadership there as well. And um, we also have a lot of special events. Um, Hopefully we're right back at it next year that we're able to bring on entertainment. So typically we have concerts, we have comedians that come to campus. We also screen movies here on campus that you typically get before they hit the theaters, which is really nice. You can see come the blockbusters before everybody else gets to. Um, we also have a lot of volunteering on campus. We have an EMT group. Uh, the Humane Society is actually right down the road this direction, and you'll be able to, if you want to, walk a dog for an hour a day, uh, get your puppy fixed. You can definitely volunteer at the Humane Society. For professional experiences, it is required at Clarkson that you participate in at least one. There's multiple options, though. So you can do a co-op, you can do an internship, or you can do professional research in order to graduate. But you do have to do one of the three in order to graduate. Um, we will help you find those, so no worries. You don't need to go out and find them on your own. You'll work with our career center. They also will help you build your resume. They also help out with study abroad as well. Um, they'll help you interview prep, whatever you need. They will help you with to get you prepared for those internships and co-ops. We do have two career fairs on our campus. So think of a college fair, but it's at the higher level. So you're going to be, instead of chatting with us, you'll be chatting with employers who are looking for internship students, co-op students, and they're looking for permanent placement. So you can go to the career fairs all four years of your undergraduate time just to be able to look for different things. You can talk with as many employers as you'd like. It's up to you, but we do that twice a year. So after college, a little bit about Clarkson. So we're in the top 40 in the country, actually we're in the top five in New York State for on average salary for our students. Um, right now we're at 97% placement rate with all of our seniors. Um, we will know this year's senior class, we're actually graduating this Saturday, we will know their stats roughly in about 10 weeks. Um, so we'll be able to update that number and get that to you. And a fun fact about Clarkson, one out of every five Clarkson grads, no joke, is a CEO, president, a vice president or senior executive or owns their own company. So entrepreneurship and innovation is very much so a part of Clarkson University for sure. So now that you've learned a little bit about Clarkson, I'm going to pass things off to Coach Jones and he's going to tell you all about the hockey programs here at Clarkson. I'll just talk quickly here. The way I'll, I'll, I'll take a little different direction here. I, I've obviously been in college coaching for 30 years. <clears throat> I've been at uh, Clarkson for 10 years, and I think we're in a really good spot as a program. Um, we're fortunate that we're just 30 minutes from the Canadian border. Uh, so we have a long history uh, of tradition here at Clarkson with, uh, with the, you know, the women's programs new. They won three national championships. So they, they, they right to the top pretty quickly here with, uh, with their uh, competitiveness. I think I just saw the, uh, um, the centralization for Hockey Canada come out. I think there's four girls out from Clarkson are into that group as well, 3D and a goalie. I think they left maybe one forward off that should have been on that list. I don't know how they left her mm -hmm. off, but it is what it is. So um, ourselves, uh, you know, looking at our, our history with our program, you look on, on the list up top, we've had a ton of NHL drafted players. Uh, this is actually going into our 100th year of, uh, of our program right now. The nice part about our program is we're in the ECAC, which I think is – is the best combination of student athletes of any league in the country. 
I think it's it's got the six Ivy League schools. It's got six really competitive academic schools, uh, which makes up the 12 schools in our league. Uh, we won national championships. Our, our team, we had last two seasons cut short with COVID protocols. Uh, but at the time where our seasons were cut short, that's four seasons in a row. We're one of the top 16 teams in the country. And more, more times than not, we're top 10. And that's both programs quali qualifying for the NCAA. So um, on a D1 level, I feel we're right at the top for a combination for a school that combines both. Uh, academics and ac athletics. Um, when you look at our overall uh, team and where we come from, I thought this would be really um, interesting for you to see. If you look at our men's team, you know, we're looking at probably 80, 69, 61% in terms of where our team's coming from. That's that's Canadian players. And you look at the women's, it's a, even a little bit higher uh, recently, but right, right in the same range. So you're talking almost 70% of both of our teams have come from Canada. It's a, it's a right in our backyard. It's critical for us to have success uh, that we get international players here. Uh, it's a big part of our recruiting. One thing I want to take maybe some of the uh, your students through is a little bit of uh, maybe the model for development, because that's something that I haven't heard really anybody. I've listened to all the talks so far. A little bit about what a week is. Uh, we have three hours of ice a day. We don't use that as a coach, uh, but we take up generally an hour of that, and we have pre- and post-practice ice. We have strength and conditioning uh, coach that's uh, just individualized for our program that works for athletes out of our season and twice a week with our with our team. Um, we have rapid shot shooting in our facility, and we just had a renovation with our rank, uh, almost $30 million renovation, and we did we put it kind of through everything that's uh, for our tools for development for our athletes. You can see the front of our rink right here um, into the bowels. That's our training room on the left. You have your cold and hot tub for the contrasting uh, recovery room on the top. We have a sauna that's nice. Coaches use that a little bit more than their players. Didn't get to use that during COVID this year. Um, and that's our weight room. So we have a weight room on, a, on the first floor when you come into our building for the, for the students on campus, for our faculty and that. And this is a 5,000 square foot facility on the bottom, straight for our men's and women's hockey team that we get to use. Um, our guys come here, aspirations, two things. We, we aspire to be great in everything we do. That's our, that's our model here. When we do it, we do it well. Uh, so we look for good students. We can, we can combine the merit money like you heard earlier with our scholarships. We're a full scope. We have a full, full allotment of scholarships. But our, we, we're looking for good students because it, it stretches our dollar. So it helps us big time with, uh, with our recruiting. But we want people that want to be great in the classroom and want to be great on the ice. That's kind of our model here. So uh, we get after it here. Uh, but for most part, a week is Monday to Thursday you practice and play Friday, Saturday, and usually Sundays off. It's, we have a chef that works with our teams. We have meals for our athletes after every night. Uh, it's a rapid shooting room right there. Uh, but for the most part, that's a renovation with our new new locker room. We have the uh, all the uh, all the fixings in uh, in a in a lounge for our players. Uh, we're excited about uh, about our program. We're excited about the university. I know our players. I had one player go right into uh, the NHL at the end of our season. Josh Dunn played with the Columbus Blue Jackets right after our season. Vice versa, J.C. McLean. He got one of the most coveted recruited uh, jobs off campus. He was because he was an athlete. Boom! He starts. Uh, July 1st, I think his medium income to start, I hate to tell you, uh, he starts just below $80,000 for a starting salary. Got one of the better jobs, but uh, that's why you come to Clarkson. We're going to set you up for life. Wow. Casey, I didn't know that. No, it's a good job. It's a good wow, job. Yeah. Dad, that's dad played amazing. a lot of years in NHL. John McLean is a big time player, so big time. Big time. So directed at Clarkson, there's a question for you, Casey. What um, what kind of players are you looking for for your program? What are the first things you look at when you evaluate a prospect? We go right back on character references and make, make sure there's uh, there's no red flags there in terms of someone that's coachable, um, that does the right things on and off the ice. And then we go from there. From that point on, we're looking, obviously, for some elite qualities. Um, you know, whether hockey IQ and compete level usually is where we start. And then we kind of take it from there. We like size. We need some players that can compete. Uh, that way, we need some players that can add offense. Um, Ayrton Martino is an incoming player for us this year, signed in Elio to Toronto. He's ranked currently uh, right in the top 30, 40 players for the NHL draft coming in. Alex Campbell, he's a Toronto player. Alex Campbell last year draft, got drafted 65th overall in Nashville. He's from Montreal. Um, so we're, we're looking for elite players, but we're looking for all kinds. We're looking, you heard uh, the Vermont AD talk about defensive defensemen. We need those too. We need some size. At Clarkson, I like to have a little push, a little bite to our game. 
Uh, we push the pace offensively, but overall, it's uh, you know we're looking for a lot of different characteristics. But character and uh, and quality of uh, a person probably starts with starts right there. And would you say the information about the men's program is similar to the women's program? Very much so. They uh, where we share the ice during the day. They get their three hours. We have our three hours. Uh, the academics lines up pretty well with our. We have players. I think we had four players in engineering this year. We had a, a large, large portion of our uh, student athletes in the business. We had some players uh, in the psychology department as well. So across, right across campus. But our guys, uh, I try to encourage our guys. E and M program here is outstanding. My engineering program start there first. But our, our business program really sets you up for life. They do a good job of building your resume, which I think is fantastic. Force you to take, uh, force you to do some things that really set yourself up for success when you're when you're done here as a student athlete. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate the information. It, it looks like people have a ton of questions. So please keep those questions going in the Q&A and private chat. I saw some great questions about like engineering requirements. Go ahead and ask. Um, go ahead and ask directly to admissions. So that would be um, Carrie and her, her it name is just the name of the university, okay. Clarkson. And then uh, for Casey, feel free to keep fielding any of those hockey questions. And um, we're gonna keep things uh, moving to Plymouth University, Plymouth State University, excuse me, uh, and, uh, and Sandy. Hi, Sandy. Hi, how are you? Good, good to see you. Okay, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Great, thanks. So hello everybody, my name is Sandra Magar. I'm the Associate Director of International Recruitment and it is my role to work with the coaches on helping them admit um, hockey players. I review their applications, really um, you know, look at the whole picture of all the students' applications coming in from all over the world. Um, a little bit about Plymouth. Plymouth is in the center of New Hampshire, which I call the vacation Mecca of New England. We're only an hour and a half from Stansted, the border, um, about three and a half hours from Montreal, Ottawa, about um, five. And all our students do fly in to Boston and Boston is only two hours south of Plymouth. Um, also around, oh, here I'm looking at the wrong, sorry, slideshow, here we go. So Plymouth has 4,200 undergraduate students and um, about 2,000 graduate students. We do have a number of our students that may, you know, are in within our 50 majors and 60 minors. We do also have students that do transfer into Plymouth that are hockey players as well. Um, the average class size you're going to find is 21. And what is so great about that is that the students get to know who the professors are and the professors get to know who the students are. And that is the number one thing I tell our international students is please get to know your professors because they're the key for job opportunities, internships and research projects. So it's really, really an, um, important for them to be connected with their professors, as well as they are aware and support the student athletes um, here at Plymouth. Um, our students are coming from 45 different states and 26 different countries. We do have a large population of Canadians because they are either hockey players or skiers. Uh, Plymouth does offer scholarships. We have a range from for this year it was six thousand to ten thousand, and there is opportunities for additional scholarships once they are have been already admitted and been here for a year. They can apply for additional scholarships. Our international students can work on campus as well, and they are pulled in to help out with many different athletic events or in different departments. You would find them in the biology department, working on research projects to um, working in, you know, at the sporting events as well. We do have an honors program. So if those students are interested in the honors programs, they tend to get invited into that if they're wanting to be challenged some more. Plymouth does have an application process. We are rolling um, admissions. So we do have a deadline of June 1st for our international applications. The national deadline, as you've heard throughout the um, couple hours, is May 1st, but 
in Plymouth has a June 1st application deadline. Our deposit deadline is July 1st. Um, we do have a free application called the Panther app and students can also do the common app. Sometimes we waive the, app, the common app application fee, but those are at certain times of the year. So usually when a student visits the campus or does an online visit, we might um, waive their application. Our international students do have to do um, language proficiency, but for Canada, it's not required unless they're in the French region and they have not gone to an English speaking school. If they have a strong English background, I can do an interview with the students and with Coach Russell with his recommendation um, regarding their English proficiency test. These are some of the programs that our international um, Canadians participate and it is athletic training, business, and all the different areas in business, uh, along with criminal justice, education, exercise science and sports physiology, and also nursing. I did not add that. So we do have a couple of international Canadians that are in our nursing program. And with these programs, we do have an MBA and we have a master's in exercise science and sports physiology as well. And we would see a number of our Canadians go on to those programs. Plymouth has 90 plus student organizations, uh, uh, you know, in the areas of academics, um, you know, fine arts, student government, fun activities, you know, if they're not able to play hockey at that time of the year, they're also participating in different, you know, fun, other fun activities like rugby or um, intramural soccer or volleyball. And we have 25 NCAA um, sports. And before I go on to this, Plymouth does, um, you know, have a, we're a really tight community where you're going to find a lot of um, students really welcomed in our programs and with not just on the campus, but within our town. Let me just go ahead and let Craig go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy. We appreciate it. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, as you can see, our arena here um, gets an incredible amount of student support. Um, this was built in 2010. Um, and we've just had the fortunate ability to play in front of our students and our community since then. Um, both men's and women's hockey play out of here. We both have a dedicated locker room, athletic training space, uh, full-time strength coach at a brand new state of the art, 25,000 foot, um, or 25,000 square foot uh, weight room um, that's in the middle of a renovation, um, but we're using the space. Um, and it's being utilized for the, with the physical therapy program on campus as well. So um, a lot of different avenues to take care of our our student athletes. Um, our women's program plays in the um, NEHC, which is the New England Hockey Conference. Um, and the men's program, which I coach, plays in the MASCAT Conference, which is the Massachusetts State uh, Collegiate Athletic Association. So we, our athletic conference, I'm sorry. Um, we, as the men's team, have had the fortunate ability to be successful. Um, we've been regular season champions eight of the last 10 years, uh, playoff champions four years, the last two, um, We've won the championship and gone to the NCAA tournament each year as well. So um, really blessed to be able to, to call this place our home, um, to have the support that we have in the community, um, to be able to provide our student athletes with this experience um, and to be able to go all over recruiting. We spend a lot of time in Ontario, um, all over Ontario, a little bit in the Maritimes as well. Um, and we've gone out to Western uh, Canada a little bit too. So. Um, we've got currently five players from Canada on our roster, uh, on the men's roster. And we have we do have at least another two coming into next year's freshman class. Hopefully another two or three are going to be joining them as we move through the recruiting process um, with some current applicants. Um, but this this arena, you can walk to the arena from campus. You don't you don't need to have a car here at all. Um, everything is walking distance. We have an academic campus that's up on a hill and then there's a river and on the other side of the river, there's the athletic campus. Um, again, everything is walkable. We're located right on Main Street in Plymouth. Um, there is a shuttle service that will take you to the bigger 
grocery stores and things on the other side of town, which is a couple of miles away. Um, so it's really important to note that the, the sense of community is all over town. Um, and there's a great synergy in between um, the community members and the student body. Um, with our men's program here, um, most of our student athletes are in the business school um, in, in many of the different areas that, that Sandy had in her slide. Um, we do have a couple of others that have been in the criminal justice, um, education, um, and exercise and sport physiology areas, but by and large, we're mostly in the business school. Um, and I would say that the sales program is the most rapidly growing and the finance one seems to be um, a constant as well. Um, we've had a 3.4 GPA as a team uh, each semester for the past 13 semesters, um, something that we're very, very proud of. Um, we graduate 100% of our players on time, um, whether they transfer in here or come here as a first year student. So, um, you know, I, I believe that, you know, the education is, is paramount for them to be successful in their life. And they're using hockey as a vehicle to get themselves here if they have a chance to go play professionally. When their time is up here, they certainly have that ability and we have the connections to afford them that. Um, but really, we're, we're focused on pushing them into some career paths that um, they're most interested in. Um, this year will be our 50th anniversary for our men's program coming up, so we're really excited for that. Um, we'll have some extra apparel and things for the, for the guys to be wearing around campus and to send out to our alums and to our booster club. So um, something that we're really excited about. Um, but back to what we afford our student athletes, uh, men's and women's programs, both again, the full-time strength and conditioning coach in that state of the art facility. Uh, we just finished an outdoor turf field um, that will be available for some training sessions in the preseason. Um, there's also an indoor track um, for us to utilize if uh, there's inclement weather during our preseason. Um, but we practice uh, at minimum for an hour and a half, of, hour and a half a day, four days a week, two games a week. Um, we do have some time for some skill development prior to practices, um, and the women's women's team does as well. So we, uh, again, we want to just provide the most development that we can and, and spend as much time with the players as we can, but want them to be able to have that academic and that social and that athletic balance that we find so important. Craig, there's a couple of questions. Sure. Do, you just, do you just look at GTHL for recruiting? Um, we are all over um, Ontario. Typically, we look to the OJHL and the CCHL. Um, those are the primary leagues that we that we look to. Um, mostly any of the, the junior A, a tier two junior A leagues that are throughout Canada. Those are those are where we look at for the most part. And another question is, I'd like to ask the same question again. What do you guys look for when you are recruiting for your men's program? And what are the first things you guys look for when evaluating a prospect? That's a great question. Um, and I'll echo Coach Jones at Clarkson that, you know, we, we look at the character first. Um, we can see on the ice very well what, what a player is capable of, but we need to make sure that the character is, is high. Um, we'll go as far as talking to the local Zamboni driver at their home rink or the local rink manager, um, find out how those individuals are treating those staff members around them that support them. Um, we will um, obviously speak with their coaches. Um, if we if we can um, speak with some of their coaches prior to where they're playing junior hockey, then we will definitely do that as well. Um, the hockey world is pretty small, so we don't have to try too hard to, to find people that know players around, um, even in Canada. and. We do have some scouts around um, different provinces as well through Canada, so we rely on them to, to help us out with that and to find those high character pieces. Um, once we get onto the ice, we look for exceptional qualities and look for uh, those that take pride in what they do. If you're going to be a stay-at-home defenseman, do that and do it well. If you're going to be a very offensive-minded forward, do that and do that well. If you're going to be a, a goalie that's aggressive, do that well. Um, we want to see people that are players that are comfortable in, in their position and, and knowing um, you know, also, but also knowing their limitations. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't expect development from them. Um, it's a jump, no matter what, no matter what league they come from, to come from, to college hockey. So we want to make sure that um, that that development piece does not get missed, and they take advantage of that extra ice time that I spoke about earlier. Do you have to be AAA only? Uh, primarily, we look at junior junior hockey, so uh, tier two junior hockey. Most of our first year players are 21 years old when they arrive here. Some are 20. Um, we've had a couple of players come right out of prep school at 19 or 20 years old, but most most are coming out of are aging out of their respective junior leagues and, and coming here as 21 year old freshmen. 
And another question, and please forgive me if I'm saying this wrong. Um, do you look at NYHL? Um, I'm not totally familiar with what the NYHL is. Um, but again, most of what we concentrate on is um, are those various tier two junior A leagues throughout um, throughout Canada and in the U.S. That's all the questions I have. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for the info. And uh, it looks like Terry wanted to follow up with women's. Um, any Anything you would mention about where you look for women's hockey players? Um, the women's landscape is, is very different from the men's uh, landscape with respect to uh, post-grad hockey, but they look at AAA leagues. Um, they look at um, some, of, some of the junior uh, women's junior leagues that exist, um, the provincial junior league, um, and they, they look through prep schools, um, New England high schools. Um, they do. I don't think any of us are going to leave a stone unturned. We're going to try to explore every avenue and try to find the players where they are. Awesome. Thank you both so much for your time. And if you have more questions for the representatives from Plymouth State, please make sure to send them a private message or you can uh, post in the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we are headed into the final um, college of our program. We have Providence College coming up. Hi, Matt. How's it going, Jenka? Good. All right, and we've got we've got some we've got a coach on the road as well. Awesome. I'll hand it yep. over. To both Nate of you. is Nate's a busy guy, so he's going to join us from the car today. So I appreciate that. Um, but I have some slides that we can um, go through, and then um, we will go from there. Uh, perfect. All right. So it's my job to kind of define who PC is uh, and what Providence College is all about. And then Nate will talk a little bit more specifically about the hockey programs here at the college. So Providence College in a nutshell is a small Catholic liberal arts institution located in the capital city of Rhode Island, the smallest state in the US. And we're just over 4,000 total students. So usually when people ask me about campus, I kind of tell them that we are this medium size institution I feel like 4,000 is big enough where you're going to see new people and new faces essentially every day, but at the same time, it's small enough where that community atmosphere definitely plays a large role in your experience. There, the average class size is about 20 students at Providence, so you'll definitely have a really good relationship with your professors throughout campus. And there's some aspects about Providence that I think make us really unique and that make us kind of stand out. And so the first is that we're the only school in the country that was founded and is still run by Dominican friars. So there's about 50 Dominican priests who live on campus. They do things that you would expect a priest to do. They say mass on Sunday, they teach religion classes, but they also do things like you might not expect a priest to do. Um, uh, they teach biology classes. I've seen Dominicans start a food fight in the dining hall. I can't reveal their identity, I'd get in trouble, but they're a pretty unique aspect to campus and I think something that our students uh, really enjoy over the course of their four years. The other thing that's probably the most unique aspect academically about Providence College is our development of Western Civilization program. I mentioned that we are a liberal arts school and this course really kind of sets the tone for your academic life on our campus. It's a two year class that every student takes at Providence, regardless of what you end up majoring in or what you end up studying. And the unique aspect about it is that it's a team taught interdisciplinary class, which means that there are professors from a number of different disciplines and a number of different subject areas working together to guide you through the development of Western civilization. So I can promise you that whatever you end up choosing to study and whatever you major in, the things that you learn in this class play a pretty big role over the course of the next four years on our campus. I think academically speaking, it, it, we, there's the saying that learning is going to happen everywhere when you're a student at Providence College. And I think obviously you're gonna learn a lot in the classroom at Providence, but I think a lot of our focus has taken place outside of the classroom in, with things like internships, study abroad, and research experience. So study abroad is definitely a big component for our students. As you can tell from the slide, 
a little more than 60% of our students end up incorporating study abroad or study away into the course of their four years. And there isn't a major or a course of study that would prevent you from doing that. We think that this is an option that should be available to everyone and you should be able to take advantage of that over the course of your four years. And so there are a lot of study abroad programs that are pretty specifically geared towards individual majors um, and, and, and individual programs. And on top of that, a lot of the programs that we offer will pair your academic experience with an internship or research experience while you are studying abroad. The fact that we are located in a capital city means that we have really close relationships and very close access with our students to the downtown area, which provides them a lot of great opportunities to get involved with internships. I think that supplementing what you do in the classroom with that practical real world experience outside the classroom is certainly valuable going forward. And that's why such a large percentage of our students end up doing an internship over the course of their four years. And this kind of leads you to the next piece, which is how successful are PC graduates post Providence College. And as you can tell from the slide, we have a pretty good rate of students that are uh, employed or attending graduate school once they graduate once they graduate, and also that they are working in a field that they wanted to work in when they studied for um, their undergrad. Obviously, Nate's going to talk a little bit more about the hockey program specifically, but I think one of the big uh, deals about Providence and why students are really attracted to PC is because it's kind of rare for a smaller school our size to have Division I sports on a whole. So obviously the hockey program has been very successful, but I think our basketball program is definitely a big draw for students. You can tell from the slide that the past couple of years have really been the, the most successful in the college's history. And I think both our students and staff and faculty really enjoy that aspect about Providence College. And so for students to, be have, to have that balance of the big school atmosphere when it comes to athletics and school spirit, but also at the same time not sacrificing the small academic experience in that environment is definitely something that our students are looking forward to. Outside of academics, or excuse me, outside of athletics, then I think our campus is a really active one where students are definitely involved in a lot of different things outside the classroom. On top of the different clubs and organizations, again, the fact that we are so close to a downtown capital city means that there are a lot of things that students can get to explore um, within the city. It's kind of known as the creative capital, uh, and there are a lot of different schools in the city of Providence. Uh, and it's a phenomenal place for you to just kind of get to wander off campus. Uh, your PCID is basically a free pass to the bus system and the transportation system here in Providence. So you can, it's very easy to get around. Um, the entire state, it, you can go through the entire state in only about one hour. So it's a small place, as I mentioned, it's the smallest state within the US, but that means that there's a lot to do that's really close to campus and where we are. Uh, so that it kind of wraps up uh, my aspect about Providence College. So I'll turn things over to Nate who joins us from the car and Nate can talk a little bit more about the hockey program here at Providence College. So Nate, take it away. Thanks, Matt. Give me the thumbs up, make sure you can hear me. Perfect, you're good to go. Great, uh, great. Uh, well, the hockey program is, you know, has had an amazing tradition at Providence College. It's a big part of the college, um, which makes speaking, you know, today pretty special, you know, on, on behalf of the school. We've, you know, um, I can tell you, I've been the head coach of the program for 10 years. Uh, within that 10 years, we've recruited players from every province and Canada except Quebec. Um, so we're, we're in um, Canada constantly when uh, and in non-COVID times, uh, recruiting, looking for players. Um, we play in Hockey East, which is a, a New England-based league. Um, it's traditionally thought of as the best hockey conference in Division One college. Um, I would say uh, regularly five to six players go directly from our league right to the NHL, which is... Um, you know, a very good development. We had a player this year that uh, went straight from our team to the New Jersey Devils. His name was Tice Thompson. Uh, so it's it's very high level hockey. 
and it's it's highly scouted by NHL teams, but it's highly competitive. Um, our league, we won the national championship, Providence College, in 2015, and another league from or another team from our league won the national championship uh, this year in UMass Amherst. So it's very good hockey. It's very high level hockey, um, but it's when we speak about Providence and Providence College hockey, one of the one of the great things about our school is it's one of the bigger sports on our campus. Um, we're a school that, as Matt mentioned, isn't large in size. Um, so we don't have all the And Nate's service seems to have stopped out. Go, oh, there we go. Okay, go ahead, Nate. A typical academic day for our players is early in the morning. Um, they're grabbing breakfast and then their classes anywhere from Players take the uh, same traditional uh, majors that every other student at our school takes. We have many guys in business. We have many guys also um, in history. Those seem to be two of the two of the larger majors of our of our team. Um, well. That's what happens when uh, you're a busy guy and you're in the car and service is not always the most reliable. Um, but I think what, you know, what coach talked about, um, the fact that some of the students on the hockey program or on, on the hockey team right now have a wide variety of different academic interests. Um, and I think there's always a lot of support for our students and athletes, so for um, our not just students within the hockey athletes, team. They get all the academic support they need, but they also get the relationships with the professors they need to be great. So I uh, maybe you lost me just for a second there. I did, but you're back. Uh, and so we have okay. one question well, from. There are usually around eight, 11 to 18 students that our guys are, are able to have uh, very, very tight relationships with their professors and do very well academically. I mean, just as proud as I am that we have guys in the NHL, um, I'm equally as proud that we have we have leaders in just about every business or every um, every shape or, or career in life. So it's a great college, and, and being a student athlete at our school, particularly in ice hockey, I think develops you to be a leader in whatever you want to be later in life. Coach, we had a question from one of the attendees who wanted to know what type of attributes that you look for when you're recruiting different players. Well, first and foremost, you have to be a good student. I can tell you that. Um, it's, it, you know, Providence College is a high-level academic school, so you have to be a good student. Um, but you also have to be willing to work, and I think that's, the, that's probably one of the, the biggest attributes that we look for are players that are of high character and have a high work ethic. Um, because as I mentioned early, earlier, when you walk through the day of a student athlete at our school, it's extremely challenging. And you have to be disciplined um, to be great at both. So, you know, character um, and willingness to work are two of the biggest attributes we look at, along with their talent level and, and the need that we have on our um, positionally on our roster. Fantastic. All right, coach. So you've been at you've been at the college for 10 years now. Uh, so what's your favorite aspect about Providence College? If you had to, um, if I'll you had to pick honest, just my one aspect is the school. It's not, you know, I, I worked at a smaller school that was uh, 1800 students and I've worked at large schools that have been 16,000 students. 
I, what the aspect I love about Providence is the size. I love the 4,000 students. Um, you get across campus, you can see a lot of people, um, but you don't know everyone. And, and I think there's an aspect of not knowing everyone else. We don't have fraternity and sororities. Um, and I think because of that, our, our student body is really one. You know, like you don't see social structure in our student body. And I think that is very unique about Providence. And every student that has come to Providence College, that's what I'm with. Really, kind of the same at our school. Yeah, I think the uh, the size aspect is definitely, you know, one of the things that keeps me on campus for as long as I've been here now, too. Uh, this is uh, year 14 for me uh, in the admission office, and I also work a lot with international students as well. Um, and I would definitely agree that the size uh, of campus makes for a really great feel, both academically and extracurricular wise. Good to see you in rank cafeteria, but lay off those cookies. I saw you last week with a whole plate <laughs> yeah. of cookies and... You know, just had just had to bust your chops there. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Coach. Um, I think that is basically all of the time that we have. So I'm going to turn things back over to Jenica, and um, we will see everyone soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Thanks for having me. And there's not a safe cookie on our campus. I can tell you that. <laughs> Um, and Matt, before we wrap up, so the Providence folks are going to stick around for another few minutes. I won't close up the room so that you still have an opportunity to communicate with one another via the chat. So the room will stay open for another about 10 minutes until all the questions are answered. Um, but Matt, I think there was just a little confusion about the scholarships. So through athletics, you could potentially get a full scholarship no matter your, your background, no matter your citizenship. He was also speaking about Correct. academic scholarships, which is a different story. Yeah. yeah, so there are two types of scholarships, essentially, that Providence offers. And the first type is an athletic scholarship. Um, and those can go up to and include the full cost of attendance for students. And those are basically awarded at the discretion of the coaching staff. Um, so the admission office is aware of students that are going to end up receiving one of these awards, but we're not the primary um, people that, that make those selections. The, scholarship, the additional scholarships that the college does offer are merit-based awards. And while we do have merit scholarships available for both domestic students and for international students, the highest level of scholarship that we award is a 60% of tuition. So those are the highest uh, scholarships that basically non-athletes are eligible for, regardless of whether you're a U.S. citizen or an international student. Um, well, there's a there's a question here for coach, and I, I think because we have such a distinguished coach on, we got to make time for it. Um, so, um, Nate, the question is, what is the experience like at World Juniors for you, and what did you take away from it? Now we're, we've shifted into interview mode. <laughs> um, it was a great experience. Um, you know, obviously, it's um, you're on the world stage, and and I know it's it's a very very big event. Uh, very well televised throughout Canada. I thought it was special because the tournament was in Canada this past year, um, you know. And and I think it's I think it, what was really special about it is that our team was made up of almost all college hockey players, and it showed the level that college hockey um, is at, um, you know, from across the world of all of all the best players at the at the under twenty level. So it was great. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's it's such a special event to be part of, and and for us to be fortunate to win it, um, we're pretty lucky. I will say, college uh, players on the team, uh, Pat Morton and Hart, so uh, it was equally special to come back and close. All right, we'll go ahead and shift off of mic and camera and hopefully hopefully, coach will be able to uh, to answer a couple of your questions via text. Um, and thank you so much for your time today. Uh, and if anyone has any more questions, do feel free to reach out to me. Um, and the 
the coaches and um, admissions offices will reach out to anybody who said they wanted to receive follow-up information. So they'll get that information tomorrow. I hope everyone has a nice rest of their day. We'll see you next time.